the Speed Bowl was the kind of place that every winter there were rumors that it was not going to open that coming spring. I forget whether it was 02 or 03, somewhere in that era, we lost five Saturdays in a row. And, you know, business was never quite the same after that. When you had an extended closure, people found out that, you know, being at home with their wife on Saturday night wasn't as bad as they thought, or bowling is a decent hobby and it goes on rain or shine. Uh, and, and, you know, at the time, um, business appeared to be just on the climb, on the climb, on the climb, you know. We doubled the business from 95 to 2000. We doubled the business. Uh, but, you know, looking back on it, we had that whole Earnhardt versus Gordon rivalry. And, uh, you know, at the top level, the sport was growing in leaps and bounds. And even though short track promoters around the country said, whatever NASCAR is doing doesn't do a thing for us. Well, guess what? It, it was proven that it did because when NASCAR turned down, the short track business turned down. But in that era, rainouts really, really, at a time when I really needed every dime of cash flow, rainouts really, really screwed me up. Obviously, there had been rumors that there was some issues business-wise with um, the group that owned the Speed Bowl. And I knew Terry had been looking at his options. I knew he had at some point signed an option to sell the place, which he had later told me he was very confident that the company he was involved in was not gonna want the place and he looked at it as a win-win for him and his company. I knew that those developers we're not going to exercise the option. Indeed, the reason why I had taken the $100,000 from them was basically calling their bluff. Oh, we want to buy an option on the property to develop it for residential. Well, A, it wasn't zoned for residential, and B, I didn't think the market was there. But they wanted to do it. So I said, if you give me non-refundable $100,000 and sign a non-disclosure agreement, I'll let you go and, and investigate it. And the sales price was decent if they did decide to go through with it. You know, in that era, uh, this guy, Gene Arganese, had announced that he was gonna do a, uh, a, a major NASCAR track, you know, to, to, to do cup events, all right? And he first tried to do it in North Stonington, and then he wound up in Plainfield with a dome over it. That was the, the concept. So he reached out to me uh, because we knew some people in common and wanted me to consult for him. Well, it, it really was because he thought I had some sort of relationship with the powers to be at NASCAR and he was hoping to get some kind of uh, you know so Roba Rosa promise that if I built this track in southeastern Connecticut you'll bring a cup event there which many stories have been written about how they just would not do that you know but th that was his concept so he talked about you know if if we do this we could bring the whole short track program to you know you know under the dome and uh, I said well that that could work because confidentially um, you know, I've got guys that are saying they want to buy the place, so I might, you know, I might have it sold. You know? So that, that could all sort of work together. We could do a short track program, you know, on the infield of your, your big, uh, I don't know what he was going to do, a mile track, a three-quarter mile track, uh, you know, under a dome. Well, he gets pressed for details by Corshain, and uh, somewhere along the line, Corshain asks a question about, well, how is that going to affect Waterford? And he, and he slips up, Gene does, and says, Oh, well, Waterford's not going to be even there next year. <laughs> it's, it's sold to developers, which it clearly wasn't. Actually, my hopes were set on what, they, what happened, that I took their money, they decided not to go forward with the project, and we could continue to race. But now, of course, once the story is out there, I have to, you know, I have to calm everybody down. And it, it caused, just the fact, the, the way the story got out caused a lot of trouble. I had worked with members of the press long before the Speed Bowl. So I knew if he had the story and he's a real journalist, he's gonna go with the story. So me going no comment or trying to lie to him wasn't gonna work. I, I you know, I needed, I needed to let him interview me at that point and, and, you know, get as much of the truth out about the story as I possibly could. Was there animosity towards Corshane for breaking that story? You know, for maybe, for maybe 10 seconds, because here's how it went down. Pete Zanardi was one of maybe three people in my organization that knew about the option deal. And he called me and said, Corshane's got the story. 
And I was like, you gotta be kidding me, all right? And it, it caused me to doubt people like Pete and others on my crew because it was so closely held. It was me. I, I screwed up and told Gene Arganis. <laughs> so. Obviously, when you first hear about it, it's, it's nerve wracking because you want to race. You know, you got money invested. Somebody around me said, you know, this is the beginning of the end because once you put that cloud over the place, you're just not going to get it off of there. Uh, so, and it did kind of have a permanence to it that no matter what you said, the seed was planted. How's we started racing? Started in racing. Been a part of my life, I guess, since day one. I think I was born at the racetrack. My father owned cars since he was 15. The first one was driven by Freddie Fowler. Him and the guy that built it, Dougie Weber, they were 15 years old and they couldn't get into the pit, so they actually had to have somebody else take the car in and drive and they had to watch from the stands. Best friend still to this day, Dougie Weber drove for him for a few years and then most notably probably Glenn Schaefer drove for him. I don't even know how many years and got a, quite a few wins for him. We went to the racetrack every Saturday down to the speed bowl and that was just kind of a way of life for us. Started running quarter midgets at six, ran those up through, took some years off to attend school, play some baseball. That was kind of the priority and started running the SK in 98, I believe it was, running the family car. Ronnie's a little different because when I first started running quarter midgets, when I was like, I was five or six, Ronnie was already there. If there was like a, a superstar or somebody that had already done it all, even he was, I think he was eight or nine, at the time Ronnie had already done it. So Ronnie was somebody when I was five or six, you know, my dad used to make me go up on the fence and watch him and go see how Ronnie comes from the back, you know, during, the, during his race. And then I never actually, he was always like a couple years ahead of me, so I never actually raced against him that much. So when I first started at the speed bowl and I was actually racing against him, it was a weird thing because it was almost like a little bit of hero worship for me. Now all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm racing against him. So it was always, a, yeah, it was always a little bit different with Ronnie. Whenever I did see Ron Juhas, I always thought he was one of the more methodical guys. You know, you didn't see him, I didn't see him anyway, taking stupid chances or, or you know, knocking guys' nerf bars off or anything like that. And I think that goes a long way at a racetrack like this because you're not facing constant payback. There are guys we know that I think every time they pull in the pit gate here, they might win, but they also might get paid back from something that happened last month. You know, that probably isn't going to happen to a guy like you, Hus. He was uh, so low-key, you thought he was in the wrong sport. Very quiet. Very quiet. Ron's, Ron's a very quiet guy. He was always a quiet guy, but uh, you could always count on him to have a good side-by-side, -side, clean racing. Really clean. He's not going to race you any harder than you race him. Um, he'll race hard, though. And he would always downgrade himself. Oh, I'll be lucky if I make the feature. But, but I think something must have happened when he turned the, uh, put the helmet on. You, Haas, totally sucked. <laughs> no. Uh, he, he was good. He was always good there. He ran for the championship. He was always up front with that ugly green car. He was uh, very upset that he didn't win the championship in 2005 because of that two throw out racing rule. I approached this business as, don't tell me, you know, what you've done forever. You know, tell me why we can't change things, you know. And I was always that guy that just really didn't care about how it had been done before. Let's try something new. For what it's worth, Terry was a great promoter. And he, had, he always had a very unique ideas about the track. So we had built a longer and longer schedule because rainouts were more and more of a problem to my budget. So I started early and ran late because I had to slot in in between the, the fall final and, the, and the, the World Series, had to slot in there somewhere. So I wound up with like a 26-week, 28-week some year schedule. But people were saying that is a long time to race every Saturday night. Wives especially were like, I, I can't get my guy out of there. I can't get my husband out of there for a vacation. So one of the owners of the track was a veteran yacht racer, you know, sailboat racer. And he said, you know, in most sailing championships, you get to throw out one or two or three of your worst finishes. So he says, what if we come up with a deal where they can drop their two worst races and, and still be in contention? So they came up with the idea that you could go on vacation for a couple weeks if you wanted to, and we'll take your two worst finishes and drop them from the record. The duel between Summers in the 11 and Ron Uhas in car number six. 
Robbie Summers competed on the Wheeling Modified Tour for many seasons, uh, was tired of that grind, said he wanted to have some fun. So he became a regular at Waterford Speed Bowl. Just burned out on the tour. I just wanted to do something fun, get away from that deal and, and do something different. It was crazy. I went into that season thinking I was going to win the championship. I would that was just dead set on my mind. I, we went there the first night and we were good and we blew the motor up the first night. Now you would say under normal circumstances, that might be it for his championship. Side by side in the back straight away. Ron Uos leads by about a half a car length, but Chris Pestrick's got a quick car. Let's see what happens off of turn number four. Taking down the victory, we'll call it number six. I actually borrowed a motor from Ronnie Silk's father for the second night, and we ended up winning the uh, second, second race. Uh, Robbie Summers, can he do it? Out of turn number four by about two car lengths, taking down the checkered flag. Number 11, Robbie Summers. They started the night only two positions apart. I mean, they've broken away from Dennis Gator. Oh, trouble over in turn three. Point leader is involved. Ron Juhas is collected with Sean Monahan. Juhas up to six, four positions behind Robbie Summers. Robbie Summers in prime position to pick up a championship as they come off turn four. Why this year and why with this team? After that first mishap we've uh, had to begin the year, we've uh, had a good string of runs and we've had some luck on our side. Now, if it was uh, scored the normal way where every race counted, Ron Juhas would have won a championship. But because of that rule, Summers' two worst finishes were far worse than what Ron Juhas was were. He was able to get the championship. I always thought it was unfair to uh, Ron Juhas because you're supposed to be rewarded for consistency, and he wasn't. But they never had that rule again. That was just a one and done. I liked it that year. <laughs> <laughs> the people that were serious about running for points never throughout any of their, their races. They just kept racing, trying to make the ones that counted even better. So the, it, it didn't discourage, it, it didn't encourage them to take a vacation. So we, I still had the angry wives amongst that set. And the press box could not stand it because they couldn't on any given night figure out who was really leading the championship because they'd have to calculate who, what, what were the, the bottom two that they were going to throw out. So I just, I just took so much pressure from Pete Zanardi and others like that that I said, you know what, it, 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 it sounded like something that was innovative in the business, but it didn't get the bang for the buck. So the drop two rule is actually what put us in championship contention that year. Late model stock cars now move out onto the speedway. Three drivers with a shot at the championship. Mark St. Hilaire has an 18 point cushion over Bruce Thomas Jr. and Alan Coates. We went into the finale. We had a chance to win it. Not a good chance, but a chance to win it. In the last race of the year, we were coming down points to win the championship. Now remember, in order for Alan Coates or Bruce Thomas, for them to have any chance at all to win the championship, they have to finish first or second. And that was the year that St. Hilaire broke the last race. Bailey, smoke coming from Mark St. Hilaire. Mark St. Hilaire has cooked his engine. The point leader up in smoke into the final nine laps of the 2005 season. You know, I, I felt bad for my crew and for my sponsors and stuff when that happened. You know, I went in the trailer, sat down. I didn't want to talk to you at that point. Mark blew the motor, and I needed one more spot to win the championship. Here comes Curtis trying to take the spot away from the 36. He pulls it off. He needs to be in the top two. He is third. Three car lengths behind second place. Dennis Botticello on the back straight away with five laps to go. I did everything I possibly could. I was one spot out. Leading on the back straight away. Car number 94 in the turn number four for the final time. will win here this evening at the Waterford Speed Second, and Alan Coates will fall one position Man. short. Right now, we are being told that Mark St. Hilaire, unofficially, by two points, you are the 2005 late model champion. Alan Coates is over here, congratulations. He did not win a race that year. I lost the points championship by two points. When you got into it, who were the heavy hitters? Uh, the first guy that comes to mind is Dwayne Doerr. He was really fast when I started, and um, we were always chasing him. Dwayne and I have never really seen eye to eye. 
Dwayne Doerr was another one, uh, he, you know, the old cliche, if you want a friend, get a dog. That was his philosophy out of track. He didn't care what happened. He was out to win, and he won a lot. Dwayne, when he moved up into the sportsman's, He'd come over because he was another one of those kids that would come out and get in the pictures. And um, I had the pleasure of helping him at the Speed Bowl setting his car up. Dwayne Doerr, the Blue Demon. Head to the stripe. It is five wins in a row for the number 15, Dwayne Doerr. Always had a weird looking car. It's like the body was just weird. It didn't even look like a street stock, but he was fast. It was nice to see him get all those wins and me setting his car up for him, get his championships. My crew worked really awesome. Boost down and well down instead of that. He's definitely a great driver, and I respect him as a driver. Without a doubt, and I respect what he's done on the racetrack. Door, go to work on the outside, waste no time in getting to the top spot. For a two year period, he was just about unbeatable. He's one of the best uh, street stock drivers that, that the Bulls seen. Billy was really, really fast. Always, always super fast. I started racing uh, after I raced dirt bikes. I broke my knee and I decided to come over here and try, uh, try the stock car. We had a cage around us, so I thought it'd be a little safer. Very few guys do that trade down. It's something about, uh, you know, pride. You know, it's just, you know, BS and, and more people should do that. You know, drive, drive what it is you can afford to drive and what you feel comfortable and what you can do. You know, go out there and have fun. I, I think I drive kind of, I drive kind of patient. I, I, I try to wait, see what happens, and give a little time. Uh, I can I can get up on the wheel when I have to, but I try to be patient. He was always a tough competitor, you know. Always, always right there at the front, you know. We had a lot of good battles together, and a lot of ugly ones too. Danny Field for the win. Phil Evans against Danny Field, and we got more than what we bargained for. Have you ever had a rivalry with one driver? Uh, basically, I don't know. Uh, uh, through the years, I guess it was one time it was Rich Brooks and I. We uh, we we were both fast, and we were both right up front, so we have to keep an eye on each other. And the number 18 maroon car on the outside, he takes the lead off of turn number two. But what does Richard Brooks have left? These two machines are side by side as they make the way to turn number three. Who's it gonna be? Taking down the victor out of turn number four, it will be the number 18, Danny Field. Just got Richard Brooks at the wire. Battle with Danny, very fierce on the track. That rivalry didn't last long, but it was intense. Brooks on the inside, Miller on the outside, Field right behind them. As they come into turn number three, Field gets contact, Brooks into the wall off turn number three, and down to the stripe it will be Danny Field, the 91 of Chris Williams, the 11 of Ken Cassidy. And to have a rivalry like that in the mini socks, which wasn't the premier division, of the Speed Bowl shows you what kind of track it was, that every division had its drama. When I first started off, it was Richard Brooks for a little bit there. He was fast. Here is Brooks. Cassidy is right there. Evans is right there. It'll all be determined in the final turn. Brooks hanging on to win it. Rich Brooks. Cassidy, they were pretty quick right off the gate. The, um, when he was first running, we used to go every Thursday for practice. And uh, Kenny was going as well. and. Uh, they asked me to drive his car one night, and I got in that thing, and they got out, and they're like, how do you think it is? I was like, oh, it's pretty good, you know? I went back to the crew and said, you guys are going to start working on our car, because that thing is twice as fast as ours. 
<laughs> we are going to settle the champion here in the mini stocks. Here comes Corral. One last chance on the outside for Cassidy. Here comes Rich Brooks on the inside. And it looks like Ken Cassidy on the outside. Joey Godbout through the years, he's been fast. Again, Godbout has the lead by a schnoz at the strike, but Danny Field not giving up on the outside. Two drivers handcuffed together. Joe Garbaut, he was good. You know, always, always tough. You know, always fast every week. Taking down the victory, car number 37, Joe Godbaut the third, Phil Evans is second, Bill Leonard is third. Of course, Danny Fields, you know, he, me and him battled hard every week. Uh, Kenny Cassidy, basically, same thing. Cassidy and Field battling for the lead. One lap left, three eighths of a mile. Two turns, they will go to turn number one, still side by side on the back stretch. Now, Joe Godbaum looks to make it three wide as they go into turn number three. Godbaum falls back. Still, Cassidy and Field side by side off turn number four. The drag race to the stripe. It is the 11 of Ken Cassidy. There's been several guys that are as competitive as I am. So you have to, you know, you have to race every night. For the most part, though, uh, when, that, when I show up, basically, they know I'm basically here to try to win or try to win something, whether it's a championship or the feature. And, uh, it makes it a little tough sometimes. Danny Field, he he was a, a a pretty good guy to me, but he rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. And we just keep bringing our totals up, and uh, I don't know. I kind of like the competition, and I I kind of like to be the guy that they all want to try to beat. of Danny Field leads the way. David Sylvia looks to dive bomb on the inside as they come off turn number four, but the 18 of Danny Field will hold on to the win. He's won multiple races in the mini stocks, multiple championships. I've battled with Danny since I started. Oh, I think he made me a better driver just because we battled that hard every week. First championship season, I mean, I've dreamed about winning championships, you know, down at the Speed Bowl. I grew up there watching guys win races and championships, and I always wanted to win one, so, you know, the first one was sweet. So that was a robbery. That was clean, hard-nosed racing between two veteran guys. Him and Danny Fields had quite the thing going on when they were battling for championships. I wanted to beat him just as much as he wanted to beat me, so, I mean, we got rough sometimes. There was one incident where it looked intentional. I can't say it was. Danny, like I said, we battled hard every week. But some of the battles I'll never forget. Like Cassidy, Phil Evans is one of those kids that grew up at the racetrack with us, literally, literally grew up with us. When I was younger, you know, I remember seeing the Rocco twins running around the track. I remember Cassidy. I uh, used to hang out with Sean and Diego a little bit back then when my Uncle Phil raced, Inc. and Emma, Alan and Joey. I really never was interested in driving cars. I was always loved watching it, you know, loved watching my family all the time. And probably about 16, 17 years old, when I got my license, I'm like, you know, and start getting into this stuff, you know? <laughs> so my brother, Joey Coates, talked to Jimmy Padgett and actually got me in the ride like three races or four races into the 2000 season. So that's how the mini stock started for me. I was never in the championship hunt, ever. I, th I, I really honestly never worried about the championship. I just liked winning races. When me and Jeff Miller used to race together early in my career, uh, we were worst of enemies. You know, we, we didn't get along. We always had on-track incidents. But he always told me, 
you're going to drive my car one day. He always said that to me, even though we didn't like each other, you know. So 2006, I think he was getting down to where he was ready to be done with racing. So he called me up, you know, offered to me the car to drive in 2007, and uh, that season was awesome. There came a time when I felt like I had done everything I could. I wasn't, I wasn't hit, hitting the financial goals out of the speedball that, that I, I wanted to see. And I wanted to try to develop something else, um, you know, what, what we call today a side hustle, uh, you know, um, and felt like it, I needed a fresh approach to largely the sales end of things. So I was on the phone with Stuart Doty, who at the time owned the RPM monthly newsletter, Race Promoters Monthly. So I was on the phone with him and I said, what I really need is a GM with a real strong sales ability because we're not selling enough sponsorships to, you know, uh, to, to hit our goals. And he said, you need to talk to Bill Roth. He just got done at, and, and I forget the name of the track, I think it was in Birmingham. He was from Mobile, Alabama. And, um, you know, he's a guy you ought to talk to. Well, I got him on the phone and he was so interested. He drove up from Alabama to, to interview. And, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, and uh, it, it, it appeared to be a good fit. He's a great guy. I never had a problem with him. I thought he did a good job. It seemed like he had the heart of the racers in mind. People were happy because he certainly was more visible and he was being involved. He wanted the Speed Bowl to the, be the place where if you went to Dunkin' Donuts on Sunday, that's what the people would be talking about. I got a 35% raise to go down to Virginia and I really yeah. couldn't pass that up. I really loved working with Steve, good at what he did as a race official. And he never seemed to get too riled up, and I think that's important. You know, sometimes with people yelling at you, you seem to could lose your temper. I think he was easygoing, and uh, that helped him. I thought he had a good run as race director. Roth was the front man at the Speed Bowl. He wasn't any technical racer, you know, didn't, didn't understand anything that we were going through, but really wanted to move the business forward. He was, he was a pretty good number two guy there. He was great with details of keeping the place running. And he really wanted to uh, concentrate on the showmanship, so he was in charge of the place. New at six, there is a speed bump at the famous Speed Bowl in Waterford. A bank now says the owner of the Speed Bowl is not making payments on a loan. And that could put the brakes on the racing there. The Speed Bowl is an institution for drivers and families across the region. It's been around since the 1950s. Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Kevin Hogan joins us live at the Mobile Newsroom in Waterford with more on that. Kevin? Well, Denise, the April racing season is supposed to start here on April 1st, but it's no early April's Fool's joke that the bank wants to check in on its note of $1.7 million. The 55-year-old speedball is about a month away from letting drivers start their engines and hitting the oval track. But now Washington Mutual Bank of Seattle has placed a major speed bump in the way of local drivers and track owner Terry Eames of Groton. They're suing him for allegedly failing to pay the $1.7 million mortgage. Terry Eames tells Highlanders News they will have racing in Waterford this year, although he reportedly has made arrangements to pay back taxes to the town, who is also being sued by the lien holder. When the first foreclosure act came to light, uh, it, it was scary because you, you just don't think there's nothing positive is going to come out of this. Harry Ames just took a step back. He was no longer involved in the day-to-day -day operation. In that point in time, things weren't going well at home for me. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't have a, a happy home life. And um, 
and business pressures are always a, a drag and uh, the business was challenging. And part of what the pressures were was, was from that uh, Connecticut auto racing site. If you really wanted to, you could go to ctautoracing.com and see if somebody posted something on there. People were able to say things anonymously, virtually unchecked. And there was the Pearl site uh, and, and that, that existed too. You know, we started the website to just you know, help promote our sponsors. I don't even know who came up with the idea to have a forum on there, but it's just the popularity of it has grown tremendously. But Jen was willing to edit a little bit there, whereas the other guy, it took, took me quite a while to, to crack through that. And uh, you know, it, it really gave, uh, there, there was a platform for um, anonymous, very hateful, very hurtful, very personal things. And it made my home life even worse because my, my ex-wife, uh, she just really could not stand uh, how we were treated on site and, and behind our backs. But when it started to detract from the business, it was like, you know what, enough of this stuff. So if we can sell the first eight acres to, to Harvey Industries and we'll sell the rest of it off, off for development and you know, I'll go do something else. That was kind of my mindset in, in that era. Sold Harvey's windows. I mean, you knew it was just one of the last steps. I think he had in his process of trying to keep the place. Seen the Harvey windows, and I kind of knew, you know, hey, the guy needs money. He can get rid of that part of the lot. But I knew he, his heart was. He liked racing. Honestly, I think it was a good thing. I think he was. He was. He needed to do it to try to keep the track going. It, it was different to see for sure, but. I knew that at the time, they were just doing everything they could to keep it a racetrack. I thought the Harvey building in the background was cool. Like there was some pictures from the infield that caught like a glimpse of it. So if it kept the track going for them to sell off that part, cool. It didn't, it didn't bother me one bit. Eight acres out of 39, I thought that was a small price to pay to keep the track open. I didn't think it was good or bad. I just, I figured, you know, it was a business move by these guys selling off some of the, some of the property that wasn't utilized for racing anyway. At the time, I thought it was a good thing because it saved the track, you know what I mean, for a, a year or two, you know. But uh, in the long run, I wish they had that open spot, you know what I mean, maybe a clubhouse or something like Thompson, you know. Back then, when I seen the Harvey Industries building going in, I thought, where are they going to put all the cars? Because <laughs> back then, they used to pack it in there, you know. So I used to go there on Friday nights, and that's where we used to camp down in the hole over there, you know, drinking and carrying on like fools, and then we'd go. You know, go to a track in the morning with a hangover. It did seem to put a little bit of a cramp on the, the camping camper area. When Harvey kind of took our spot down below, our little hidden place, um, just didn't seem the same when we were up in the open under the lights. There were still a few groups of people still doing it, but um, it's really slowed it down. I was uh, worried about it because they, they sold a the piece off with the side. And I said, boy, I hope, uh, I hope it stops there. And I saw that. Harvey's Industries in the parking lot that that was um, I was pretty sure it was over. I didn't like it. I didn't like losing that spot right there. It made me think that you know what's next to come. Is this it? And now as time went on it probably doesn't affect us one bit. I thought it was great because Terry said that's what he needed to uh, turn things around. My oldest memory at the track is definitely going with uh, my family up in the stands watching my uh, father and my uncle compete. And the mini stock started, and really the history from the family really starts there. You know, of course, we've had. You know, the best car owner in history, Peter R. Sand. Repeat. <laughs> Pretty sure my dad and Bruce Sr. did some work for Carrie Little. Carrie is Pete's cousin. So Pete owned Carrie's cars. They did a little bit of work for Carrie and Pete. I think Carrie might have been getting out of racing and he wanted to stay in it. Pete approached my father in 1995 about racing for him. They started talking and next thing you know, they built a car and they had instant success. I still wanted to go to the shop when Senior drove, but when Bruce Jr. started driving, I, I really wanted to be there. I wanted to be involved in everything he did. And he was like an older brother to me, even though he's my cousin, I always looked up to him, Nate as well. I just wanted to be anywhere those two were. And they happened to be at the shop a lot, so 
that's that's where I'd go. They picked me up from school. We'd go to the shop. We got hooked up with Pete. He asked me to, you know, race for him after my enduros, and ever since then we've just been linked up and winning races. Who's your favorite driver? When you were a kid? Oh, jeez, I'm gonna have to lie here, huh? No, you're not. Well, huh? Oh, Jay Stewart. A little backstory on Jay Stewart is um, my mother. Her sister is Angel, which is Jay's um, wife. So growing up, we'd go every Saturday, and he was our uncle, so we liked him, but he was not liked at the racetrack. Third Friday and roughly, Michael's Pools, H&H &H Engines, Paul's TV. Car number 66 visits Victory Lane with Jay Stewart on board. I really liked watching him race. He could do no wrong in my eyes growing up, so that's how the whole family dynamic thing started. And... You know, we built our first couple of cars and we've just kind of been locked to him or we were locked to him, I should say. When, when Bruce went out and had his heart surgery, Jay drove his car for him. And, you know, him and Jay Stewart were real tight. Pete still wanted to race. We all still wanted to race. Bruce still wanted to race even after his heart surgery in 2004. The natural thing to do, we just asked Jay to drive the car. And so our breakup really was, it, it, you could call it ugly. But we just weren't having fun. Like, Bruce was laid up. We did this as a family. It was Bruce. It was Nate, my dad, Bruce Sr., uh, my brother, Pete. Like, we were all a family. We did this racing thing as a family. And Jay was family. So we asked him to drive. We let him do some stuff to the car. And it didn't work. Um, we put our stuff back in. It worked. But he didn't want to say that it worked. So it was like a, we were going back and forth with each other. And it just wasn't fun. He would finished third. And that's like a good run for us at the time, like a, a third, that's a good day. And he'd get out and he'd be bitching, he'd be throwing stuff. And eventually it came to the point where Pete just decided that he didn't want to go on with Jay as his driver. And Bruce had just gotten the clearance to come back. So the breakup happened. Pete said, you know, Bruce is going to come back in the car. We don't need you to drive anymore. Bruce Thomas in car number 35, he hit Jay Stewart. They had a pretty good history over the years. So it'll be interesting to watch that battle develop. And a little nudge coming out of turn four, contact administered by Stewart. So keep your eyes peeled on those two cars. The relationship now is 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 a little uh, it's a little fractured. Jay and, and Bruce, quite a rivalry. Thomas leads the way. Stewart packed to his back bumper. Then Stewart gets into Thomas. He'll slide up the track. That allows Stewart to get that run, and he will take the lead. There was a lot of animosity in the division. Steve Haraka, on multiple occasions, told us um, he was going to pack us up for the night, um, make us take some weeks off, because um, he was tired of the demolition derbies out there. All over the back bumper of Larry Goss is the 35 machine of Bruce Thomas as he pushes him a little bit slide to the Thomas Stewart. Stewart rams into Larry Goss, bringing out the yellow. I would say by far our worst crash was... Uh altercation four years ago with the um our g car the big crash with lozniak and yeah. jay and bruce the night i flipped at the speedball i believe uh pete zanardi said it was the worst wreck that he's ever seen there the night that jay lozniak flipped i was not at the track I, we were in adirondack speedway in new york with kobaluk i was always getting texts from a crew member of ours jess and she told me bruce wrecked really hard and he she wasn't sure if he was okay so like the first thing i'm thinking like you know, it really sucks. But then I said, you know, what happened? She let me know what happened. And it's, it was, that was something that was brewing all year. That was a race I was going pretty good. I think what all started it was there was a quarrel between Bruce Thomas Jr. and Jay Stewart. Something going on. I don't know exactly what happened. And they weren't getting along. They weren't talking. They were running one and two on a restart where everybody was still stacked up, running nose to tail, double file. And Bruce goes by Jay, and that's a no-no with Jay because Jay was driving that car and you're not passing Jay. Uh, just coming out of turn four, having contact with a uh, guy in second place. And eventually you just Turn right on us coming out of four. They were coming off of turn four, and Jay decided not to turn uh, and drove 
Bruce straight into the fence. Pretty much coming to an abrupt stop from like 90 to zero and six feet. Probably one of the fastest parts of the racetrack right there. And they get into each other pretty good. He got stuff in the fence off of turn four and that just caused a melee. I went to the bottom to avoid it because I seen them guys going up. I'm like, oh, this is going to be bad. So I just turned left. And Lozniak had nowhere to go. You know, we were just running so close and so tight. And I remember seeing it all happen. And I tried getting to the bottom and I had Joe Perry to my inside and you know, couldn't get down and, and Alan became a launching pad for me. And I seen Lozniak, the bottom of his car, going by me on the driver's side. It seemed like it took forever, those five seconds of going down the front stretch, barrel rolling. looking, I'm like, what just happened? No! 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 By the time the car stopped uh, and I was on my roof looking out the windshield, um, saw gas pouring out. I couldn't get out because I was against the wall. You know, and then I looked over and they're trying to get him out, and I was like, oh, this, this is not good. Track worker came running over, helped, helped get me out, crawled out, crawled away from the car. And the driver had the car. Unbelievable. The driver was out of the car when he walked in. Stood up, turned around, you know, just gazed at the carnage from where I was down in turn one all the way down into to turn four where, where Bruce and, and Jay were, were parked up against the fence. That was a wild, that was a wild night. By far, it was probably the worst wreck that I've ever been in. Tom Fox built a hell of a race car, and I'm still walking to this day because of it. We pulled the motor, transmission, fire bottle, and the rest of the car went down to the Joy Scrapyard and went through the metal shredder and never to be seen or heard of again. I went in the pits to, to make sure Alan was all right. And uh, it's like, yeah, I got a tire mark on my helmet from that. So, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty bad. Wow. Yeah, Stewart had, did have controversies surrounding him oh, at yeah. times, didn't he? Jeff Pro has always, has always been awesome to me. He's one of those guys that you talk to and he just bleeds short track racing. Jeff Pro is probably a lot like me. Easy going guy. Does a lot of the work on his car himself. He and his dad, both really respectable on the track and off. Jeff is a great guy. I learned a ton from Jeff. As soon as I got into SKs, he was a huge part of that. Um, so was his dad, Jerry. The first thing I think of when I think of Jeff is fortunate. If I had Jerry Pearl as my father, what took me 20 years to learn, I probably would have learned in the first year. I don't think I've ever seen Jeff wreck anybody on purpose. You know, that's not his style. He'd been at it a long time, won a lot of races. And he was well-liked by everybody. He's one of those guys in racing that I, I never understood. Like, how can you do this? Because you're way too nice. A wry wit. Uh, you know, he doesn't get credited to, to be the funny guy that he is uh, as often as he should. I get random texts during the week that just, they say a sentence. And it, and it means a whole story to me because I laugh, you know. <laughs> from him. If he had been a little more angry, he probably would have won a few more races in his career. Jeff's just steady, solid. He's always, always pretty strong. Jeff Pro is a quiet, uh, quiet but aggressive type of guy come out of nowhere. You have to remember, in uh, the 2000s, when that race was the opening weekend, they got a lot of guys from Stafford, Frank Rocco, Kenny Horton, Ted Christopher. Matt Hirschman was there. Robbie Summers was there. Jimmy Blewett was there. Doug Colby was there. All the big guns came down for that race. Here's a green flag from Bob Potter and a great jump by Jimmy Blewett. He gets into the second turn ahead of the cannonball, Kenny Horton. Now a little stutter step by Blewett. That enables Kenny Horton to take over the lead. But for how long? 
Now here comes Summers to the outside of the cannonball. It is Kenny Hort leading the way in one, but he is pressured. The pressure being put on by a vice. Now it is the 11 of Summers. He'll pull even, and he just jettisons by the, uh, the 19 of Hort. New leader, 104 laps left in the race. I don't even know what happened to Jimmy Blewett. Uh, I spun him out <laughs> earlier in the race. Diego Monahan has moved to the fourth contact. Blewett is nailed by Janovic. Blewett spins into the grass. It moved me up to like inside the top five on the inside. What a race this will be for Jeff Pearl. He said on Saturday, if he could just have be one step ahead on the podium against some of the tour drivers, he'll be happy. I was always impressed with Jeff's cerebral abilities. Smart guy, very smart guy. The wheels are turning. We just kind of picked and choose our spots when we got up there. And the battle is for third, fourth, and fifth. At this stage, here comes Sean Monahan trying to slingshot his way. Contact between Monahan and Chadwick. Chadwick in trouble in turn number one. Someone spun, and next thing you know, we were now we're lining up on the outside pole. They kept on complaining, I guess, about the restarts to my crew chief. Somebody's going to get sent to the rear, sent to the rear. You got to be careful on the restarts. Start in the box, start when the flagman throws the green flag. And I knew Jeff jump starts anyways. And I just got that in my head. And he just took Robbie to school. When I heard him let off going into the corner, I just drove the thing in two car lengths more before I let off and the car turned. And then I chopped down and then I felt someone get into the back of me and I was like, holy crap, you know, I'm in the lead now. Wow, I can't believe that Robbie just let him do that. I mean, obviously he didn't want to. Total stupid driver error. What was Summers doing slowing me up? <laughs> <laughs> Jeff got the lead and gave it away. Can Pearl do it? Trying for his first ever win in the Budweiser Modified National. Kudos to Robbie Summers for not running him up into the marbles or putting him in the wall. Or... I mean, the competition was stiff. And there is Jeff Pearl with a finishing kick. Jeff Pearl hanging on by his fingernails. Will it be one last hurrah? One last bullet in the holster for Hirschman. Here they come into turn number three. Pearl it! Jeff Pearl has done it. The biggest win of his speedball career. Well, three laps to go. Double final restart. Tell us what happened. There's a very good company around me. And I was like, well, you know what? They're in our playground now, so uh, let's show them what the regular guys can do here. Right after that race was the MRS race. I was like, there's no possible way I'm going to freaking lose this race. <laughs> and that was one of the biggest upsets, I think, in the Budweiser Modified National history. Yeah, that was my best year. We, we also won the uh, Pepsi 300 that year, too, which is like another 2500 bucks. I think long distance races were well suited for him. He was mad at me one night. He came up to me after the races. And I got to tell you, my mind never really thought this, but this is what I said to him. Talk about sending somebody off the deep end. He was just being polite, trying to teach me, and I was being stubborn um, about an altercation that we had. And I said to him, listen, this is just a brief moment in time for me, pal. I will not be here forever. I'm going to race on Sunday afternoons. You're in my way, man. <laughs> it, he walked away from me <laughs> like that kid is whack. And I, I really didn't mean any of it. I knew I wasn't going anywhere. But I, I, he walked away, and I'm like, I just, I just convinced him I'm whack. <laughs> Sean's actually a good driver. As long as there was someone that could keep him, you know, keep the rope tight on him. Sean Monahan, the driver, is, he's like one of the best. I like him, and I think he can, he can wheel. He, he really can. He's probably got the best car control out of anybody I've ever seen. He's good. 
He's one of my good friends. That being said, I probably would not want to race with him. I would not want to race against him. I absolutely hate racing against him. I don't think too many people disagree with me that they don't like racing with Sean. Uh, <laughs> and I've had Sean, you know, as, as my driver, as, as his car owner, and I've raced against him quite a few times, and, and he's very unpredictable. You don't know what he's going to do next. He's the guy that you never know what's going to happen. If I had to pick someone I didn't want to race, it would definitely be Sean. The final lap on the back straightaway around Muchacharo pulls to the infield in turn number three. Sean Monahan comes off of turn number four and will win the 35-lap SK Modified feature here tonight. What about Monahan? Diego's a great kid. <laughs> Diego Monahan now makes his charge on the outside as they go down the back stretch. Brothers race each other into turn number three. Here comes Diego, gunning it. New leader with three laps to go. It's Diego. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just seen history at the Speed Bowl. Here is the first driver ever to win races in all four of Waterford's main division. He's won in the mini stocks. He's won in the sportsmen. He's won in the late models. And tonight he wins in the SK Modifieds. Diego Monahan. Well, Diego is just, uh, he's another one that I don't think he gets the credit he deserves as a driver. I think he's a, he's a really good driver. It's impossible not to have a good time with Diego, whether it's on the track or off the track. And, you know, we've even gotten into it where we bumped each other around on the track and we get out of the cars and we're just laughing about it. Like, it's impossible. He's one of those guys, like, you can't be in a bad mood around him. You can't be upset around him. It's just the way he is. He's kind of infectious in that way. Great restart for him. He leads by about a half a car length. Janovic Jr. still second. Ronnie Silk all over him, man. It's Jay Miller in third. Fox in fourth getting a little push by the 11. Here comes Janovic trying to make his move. Looking for a jackpot. Rob Janovic down low. Blurs his way underneath. Muchachero. The godfather. Rob, I think, is one of the most underrated drivers. I think underrated. I think he's the most underrated competitor at the speed bowl. Doesn't get his due for how good he's been and the, the, the length of his career. Rob's a good guy. You know, got a big group of people behind him. It, it's, they have a good program. He has had the same crew ever since I started going to the bowl. Greg Hanna, John Volpe, Don Pont. Very loyal bunch of guys. And uh, somebody said when they see those guys after the race, you can't tell if they had won that night or lost or wrecked. Because they're able to leave what is going on at the track at the track. Getting the best of that one will be the 51, Rob Janovic Jr. He takes the lead in, uh, to turn number two as they wake their way past the back straightaway. Let's take a look at Dennis Gator. He started fifth. He had a good restart. He's trying to pick up third. Now trouble. Turn number four. Everybody's going to come together. Wow, look Rob at this. Janovic, our leader, is in trouble. Mike Finkelday, Tommy Fox. Gata is going to drive away, but some cars will not be able to. As Rob Janovic has wound up against the turn four barrier. And Rob climbs out of the race car. He is okay. What a terrible turn of events for Rob Janovic. Not sure what happened there. It looks like he just came apart coming off of turn number four. And everybody's running so tight here. So when he comes apart, there's the domino effect. Tommy Fox hitting into him. Almost everybody in the top five. So our safety crew is right on the scene there to... Uh,
changes his technique. Looking for elbow roll on the bottom against Muchacharo. This time will the inside work for Dennis Data, and it will as well. But he's happy to get this one. You want to hear about the last three laps of that season? Not many people thought Don Fowler had a chance to win today, but right now he is holding off the two point leaders. We have trouble on the back stretch. A car stranded trying to back its way off. Yellow out. Donnie actually led a lot of that race. I had the race pretty much sewed up until we're riding around the caution and they tell me on the radio that your sway bar just gone disconnected and I said, I don't make like I didn't hear anything. And I think it was when uh, Donnie's sway bar link broke and Dennis got by him. Gaeta hurricaning his way to the top spot. Can he clear the 26? He gets sideways, he gets loose, he recovers. But Dennis told me after the race, he said, I hate to say it, he said, but on the caution when I saw you dragging your sway bar, he said, I smiled from here to here. <laughs> he said he knew he had me. Dennis was leading and I knew that all I had to do was stay where I was and, and I'm gonna win the championship. But I thought, you know, I want to get up there and race with Dennis. The only person that was holding me back was Donnie Fowler. Rob Janovic is still sniffing out a championship down to the final four laps. I was trying to be cautious, but I wanted to pass him, but then I was trying to be cautious. It was too scary to pass me. The car was facing everywhere but straight. And then there was at one point where uh, Diego was behind us, and he, I think he got tired of us playing cat and mouse. And all of a sudden, coming out of turn two, we're three wide. Gaeta is pulling away from Fowler. Here comes Monahan, and what a move downstairs by Janovic. Three wide action. And there's only like three laps left, and if I wreck, I'm gonna lose a championship. And the guys just start screaming at me over the radio. <laughs> so I had to back off. Dennis Gaeta will be the winner. Rob Janovic will be the champion. There's a new sheriff in town, and his name is Rob Janovic Jr. The 2007 was actually really a good year. We didn't win the championship, but we won a bunch of races and the car was really fast. So going into 2008, we're pretty confident that we had a chance. Just like when we tied Dick Dunn. Now the goal is we've got to get one more. 2008, he, he, uh, he, didn't have any, he had sponsors, but not much back in. And basically, Dennis and I were doing the work. I was helping him, but he was doing most of the work himself. going to be the 2008 SK Modified Champion? Will it be Dennis Gator, the six-time SK Champion? Can he get the job done? He's been strong all year long. Janovic might not have second for very long. Now he goes around. Contact between he and Monahan, and then he is clipped in the front of the car. 17 laps left and we have a yellow. We're trying to decide what the caution was for. Give me a minute. Dennis Gaeta is at the rear of the field with 15 laps to go. The chances for his seventh championship are in critical condition. If anybody questions it, as confirmed with the flag stand, they threw the caution for the 97 in the wall in turn one. Of the rogues gallery of uh, people I had come and help me out, Joe Lewandowski was in town and helped me out for about a season. And I was just saying, I think there's a need for a reduced cost modified from where an SK was. But I, don't, I really don't have an idea. I, I don't have it worked out yet how to do it. Lewandowski came up with the idea, let them run on used rubber. There's a ton of tires. The most plentiful tire was uh, tour type tires. Let them run on that. And I was a champion of a restrictor plate. So we did a little testing uh, with a machine shop and we had restrictor plates built and said, you know, basically run what you want, but it's going to have these four very small holes. You're, you know, you're just not going to develop a lot of, a lot of power. 
because of the restrictor plate. Back then it was just you had to have a quick change rear end and was, the motor rules were different. You had a lot less horsepower. The idea was for two different clientels. One, uh, somebody who had raced years ago, went off and raised a family, built a business, whatever, and wanted to get back in. This would be a low cost way they could pick up used, used parts because you wouldn't need a brand new chassis or brand new that to, you know, to really be competitive with this thing. And we weren't going to pay him money. We purposely did it on Wednesday as a developmental thing, a place to develop, you know. And the other marketplace was for um, people that wanted to take their kid as SK racing, but they could start in an X mod and learn the basics. So those were the two constituencies that we wanted to serve. I think you've asked in the past, why, why Wednesday, not Saturday? It really was Saturday was pretty full at the time. And so we were trying to do driver development stuff. That was the whole reason to start the Wednesday was to build more Saturday night drivers. The Mohawk man, John Yagman, very exciting driver. I remember he won quite a few races. I think he literally could have won every race. He had that big Monte Carlo. He used to win. I said, gee, how do you explain this winning? He used to go, I don't know how I did it. Oh yeah, he's definitely eclectic. We'll call it that. That's what made Wednesday so special because they had a lot of drivers like that who had personalities. Brad could wheel, I think he was a little smoother, would rather finish third or fourth than take a chance and pop a tire or something. He's always there. Pat and I got along really well. He's just one of the guys that you could trust racing side by side and knew he wasn't gonna turn into a side of you. Well, him and Brad Vogelswang were teammates. I believe it was 87 and 78, so that was a pretty a potent team. Kurt was really fast, 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 all the time fast. No matter what day it was. Coates had, I call it the A truck and I had the B truck. Scott had two trucks, so we put Keith Rocco in the other truck. I think a few races we came down in the wire side by side. Me and Howard are battling for the 
wind going down to the line, and he used to run a lot of caster in his left front, and you know, negative camber, and the thing would hang out, and my right front caught him. I was on the bottom, and I went through sailing through the air, landed, everything was good. I was ahead of him. They threw me off for rough riding. Keith ended up winning the race. Howard ended up in the wall because it just turned his wheel when we locked wheels. His wheel went right, mine just happened to go left. We came off of turn four, and I think we were three wide, and, you know, there was trucks flying, there's body panels flying, hoods flying, and, you know, one was up over the other, and somehow I came across the line first and was able to take that one down. When he was eight, he, you know, he used to come to the shop and every night and help me and work on him, and he'd never driven one other than from victory lane into the pits, you know, he's never raced one on the racetrack. You know, I drove my car, and one day I said, here, take it out and try it, and I never drove it since, you know, he took it. Now, how old was he then? He was 16. So I had to let him take it out. <laughs> I told him, take it out and drive it like it's your quad. He goes out there and he spins the thing out and he goes flying through the infield. He f comes in, he can't even open the door. It's, the mud is all the way across the, the legend car's got the, like a, you know, the frame. It just right across the floor with mud. I go, let's not drive just like your quad no more. <laughs> Fourth in line, a couple of cars scatter off turn number four. The sparks are flying between Mark Mackay and Jeffrey Paul. Now Paul shifts his momentum to the outside, and let's see if he'll be able to scorch his way around that 52 car. Oh, Paul up in the air, barrel roll, Jeffrey Paul! So our uh, safety crew alertly onto the scene. And we have, uh, hopefully, some good news from Turn 3. Jeff Paul is out of the car. Another victory for the driver of car number 91, Jeffrey Paul. This time by, the checkered flag in the air, and it will be the 52 of Mark Mackay with his hand outside the window. Here comes Chris Bakai in car number 32. He pounces his way into the lead. Into turn number three in a two car race for the win. Here is Doherty looking to the outside off the corner, but it is Palmer. A very special moment for the Palmer family, and especially for Jason. I gotta thank my dad, all my friends, my family, everyone outside here tonight. It's awesome, this is great, my first win. Who's more excited, you or your father, Jax? I don't know, he's been waiting a long time. I've been, I've been runner up every, a lot of races now. <laughs> he's still gonna yell at me, I bet though, that's fine. And I yell at him. I mean, I used to yell at him all the time. And then, you know, you know what happens? You don't listen to me no more. There were a lot of legends in those days, and Jason Palmer was just uh, one of the best. Oh, uh, great! I mean, he and his dad are just, you know, great friends of that track and great friends of me. And and uh, you know, to to see him progress from legends cars and you know, legends were, a, you know, a real favorite project of mine. That, that, that whole division and and everything, just a you know, a real class act. We got a car figured out, and and his driving was real good, and Anthony's driving was real good. I mean, that was a good car. We had a division that, you know, it was a great car count if we were in Florida, you know, or somewhere other else in the country, but by New England standards, the, the car count wasn't great and seemed to be diminishing, and we had to make a change. Late models back then were G-metric. You know, you could run a built motor and probably a big springs, nine-inch Ford rears. A metric chassis that it was a stock frame that you had to start with. That era was going to come to an end. I mean, pretty soon you're going to have to switch over to a purpose-built frame, you know, once those things dried up. You know, when Phil drove for me, we built the, the first G-metric car that they had down there. And a lot of people, you know, they were complaining about... Um, 
the cost of racing um and plus the the g chassis not being you know going to slowly disappear because guys were starting to to hoard those because they weren't available anymore people said look we spend as much money on our motors as an sk motor we spend as much money on our chassis as an sk the only thing that might be a little less money is that the tires are a little less but we burn them up with the same frequency as you know so so I heard that. I got it. You know, so I said, where do we go? And along came Tom Curley and I started to, to get knowledgeable about how he was making uh, late models successful at Thunder Road and on the ACT tour. And it really was this spec motor and very tight roll otherwise. Well, the ACT car is um, more like a, a modified. The ACT cars are so easy to, to drive. It's a modified with a, with a body on it. You know, you take a good look at those cars, they're coilovers, you know, they have Panard bars. I mean, they're set up just like an SK, just on a smaller tire with a big body. You know, we thought that Tom Curley had a great program going up there. He had a, a motor that was 6500 bucks and not 18000 And a chassis that was really a race car chassis, not not something that you're, you're trying to make a passenger car chassis do something that it was never meant to do. Basically, you're making something that was designed to be a family car grocery getter chassis you're trying to make it into a race car the chassis under a g car is made to drive down the highway the act car is made specifically for racing everything's low left light you just slap on a nice body and you put your numbers in your springs and you go racing it's there's no comparison really the act tall cars they run basically a tube chassis and they run a how front clip and coil over shocks and big sway bars and crate motors the cars are a little more delicate they had to keep up their momentum through the corners whereas you know with the g body cars we could muscle them around a little bit and, and still have that horsepower if we you know got into a little bit of, of a trouble with the car and and could drive out of it the late models we ran were kind of beefy they could uh, run and, and pack more and bounce off each other a little bit and it was a little more forgiving and the other cars aren't as forgiving when they take a hit they break we thought it would be cheaper overall for the guys to race and for most guys, it would be. The guys that were paying to have their motors built, it, it would have been cheaper. You know, there are a lot of people that hated it um, because as much as there were, um, you know, guys like Matt Kobluck that, you know, went to the best engine builder and stroke check, there were also those Mark St. Hilaire's and Phil Rondo's that assembled their stuff themselves and, you know, and built a motor for far less than the 20 grand that was the going rate for the SKs. Mark says, I build my own motors and I don't spend $6,200 on a motor. As inexpensive as that spec motor seems to you, Terry, it's still three times what I spend on, you know, on, on my motor. So it was a very difficult decision. There was a lot of uh, hesitation. You could do some things to the G cars to keep up. Plus you had the guys that were making their G chassis cars really go fast. I mean, people like Alan Coates had huge motors that would that would keep up really well. I stuck by my engine builder for quite a few years. He stepped up to the plate and he built me an engine and that thing is really stout. So we tried to engineer the rule so that the two motors were about the same so people didn't have to throw their stuff out right away. You know, but it was one of those things where I really tried to not dwell on the status quo but say, what's the future? And looking at it nationally, the future was spec motors, crate motors, whatever you want to call them. And, uh, and I, I felt we had to do it. I think we really took notice of act cars when Larry Goss got one. Larry Goss was one guy who bought into it early. Another car we've been keeping an eye on is number six of Larry Goss. As we mentioned before, that's one of those sealed motors with a tube frame, so we'll be keeping a very close eye on how that performs. So when Larry started ripping up the track with a act car, we knew eventually we were going to get one, but our funds weren't there. So Larry had the only act car there for a couple seasons. Yeah, until the Botticello showed up. Side by side, fully down into the corner with Botticello inching out front. Perry in second, St. Hilaire in third. Dwayne Knoll to fourth. Here comes Paul Hurd, though, to the outside in car number 32. And this Botticello shows up with that red 03. Remember that ugly car? I do, yeah, putting on a show. He was really fast. Um, the red 03. With that red 03 at car. Primered up 03 and just kicked their ass. I mean, he drove around them. 
like they were stopped. The writing was on the wall when I saw Dennis, and those guys are pretty smart. You know, once they got it figured out, those cars just rolled the corner way better. Between himself and Bruce Thomas in the 35, another car length back to Ed Field. Dowling rides fourth, Botticello fifth. He showed up, and that was a good car owner, a good driver at the time. He was getting up there in age, but he could still wheel a race car pretty well. These guys were all saying that they, that they, that they didn't like the motor, they didn't like the chassis, and Botticello came down and, and basically kicked their butts. <laughs> five laps into this green flag, Ronnie opened up five car lengths between himself and Mark St. Hilaire. Leads off of turn four for the final time. Checkered flag in the air for Dennis Botticello. Comes up and he whips him again. I never looked happy doing it. <laughs> I'd walk by him in the pits and be like, D dude, you're cleaning house and you're just not even smiling. <laughs> so that kind of made me say, I want one of them cars. Like, yeah, you know, that was the right the first thing. I want one of them. <clears throat> and then everybody kind of went to him. I think that might have been when guys started to say, hey, maybe there is really something to this car. If you don't make the spec motor the faster alternative, people are not going to you know, it's a herd mentality. They're not going to go there until it's proven that that's the only way you're going to win, win races. So it was Botticello that came down, and I enjoyed seeing that car uh, with, with a guy that didn't have a whole ton of laps at the place, you know, just kind of school everybody. I raced against the Botticello car when he came there. He was, like he like said, it's like no other. The thing went through the corners, and that's when I still had my late model, and the thing was pretty good, you know, still ripping off some good laps. Been a long time uh, between visits in Victory Lane. What was the difference tonight? Deal three wasn't here. So, more and more came, and then we're finishing second. We'd win a couple races, and then we wouldn't win. And then I was like, you know, that time's come. I guess we gotta park this thing and, you know, call it a day. Which it killed me to do because that car just dominated. It was old, but it worked, you know. And I just, and it made me get rid of a good car that I loved, and you know, made made me who I am. I think if you threw some of these guys that are winning now in that car into a G car, they'd have no idea what they were doing. <laughs> it's funny because a friend of mine who was, um, he was, loved the old days and he went to a race at Waterford, we got him in the infield and all that kind of thing, but he, he commented on how he thought it was so particular that the people are so picky about the way setups were now. Whereas in the, in the old days, people would have driven the car with the imperfections or things. There's a whole different setup to the way things are now. If the newer cars are a little bit off, they're not going anywhere. Whereas in the old days, a driver will compensate because things weren't as particular. Wozniak has the inside line and the run on Botticello. Side by side, they roar down the backstretch with Timmy Jordan right on the back bumper of both vehicles. The three cars tacked together as they come off turn number four. Wozniak in the middle, three wide. They'll scream to the strike. It is the 47 of Timmy Jordan taking the win. He's come all the way from the third position to 0-3. I always thought we could win, that's why we moved up. And uh, we took 2005 off to regroup, build a shop, because uh, Jordan Racing doesn't do it the wrong way, so we weren't going to race a late model out of the driveway. So we took a year off, we said we needed an at car. And I didn't really know who Timmy was. You know, when Timmy came on the scene, he was a guy that was related to Tom Fox. And win number two for the nephew of Tommy Fox. Well, a lot of people thought that he was in over his head, and then he goes and he, he just had a great car. Also working on the outside, now is the battle for the lead. Timmy Jordan with the black 47 inches his way out in front of Lozniak on turn number four. New leader, it's the 47 of Jordan. So Jordan on the outside, is he, that's been his trademark in 2006. Timmy won the, with the ACK chassis first and, and did, a, did a good job with that, and then Bruce took that up a notch for quite a few years. Bruce Thomas Jr., I, I don't know as, as he and I really got to know each other that well. I mean, I know the Thomas family very well, but Bruce and I never really bonded. I really don't know him all that well. Bruce has always been to himself. I think a word I can say for him is chill. He's, he's, he's really, he's a relaxed person. He doesn't really get too uptight, but when he gets crossed, there's no turning back. Bruce can do no wrong in any of our eyes. It's kind of like a, I was listening to a podcast, uh, the junior podcast, and every, every old-time guy that worked with Dale Sr., they ask him, you know, was it ever a time when, like, you know, he'd be like, oh, maybe you shouldn't have done that, Dale, and they always say no, like, they stuck behind him. That's what Bruce is to us, like, 
It didn't matter what happened. That's our dude. Can Ed Reed Jr. hang on? The final two laps as they charge across the stripe. It is Ed Reed looking to hold off Bruce Thomas. Thomas will make a move to the inside as they go down into turn number three. He gets the right front on it. Reed slides up the track. Thomas moves underneath. Macrino slides underneath. White flag in the air. Thomas with the lead. Serious wheel man. World of knowledge. Uh, serious chassis guy, you know, the numbers stuff. He taught me a lot. He really showed me a lot of the basic stuff to be able to get the car competitive and be able to run up front. A lot of respect for that. That guy is Mr. Late Model. He knows them cars like I know legend cars. It was weird because when I went to high school with Bruce, it would be like I'd like kick him in the ass. Like, how come you're not into racing? He had, he had nothing really to do with it as we went to school. But once he got out and he got in a mini stock, when he's determined, he makes it happen. Bruce is probably one of the most dedicated guys to his car. I don't think anybody works on his car harder than Bruce Thomas Jr. They put a lot of preparation into their car, which, you know, as a driver and doing that myself, I kind of pick up on that. And they got a pretty good program. Yo. Yeah, exactly. You thought I was kidding. You're rolling. Yeah, I got too much stagger. <laughs> As a family, we would bench race just like every other race in the family. We'd work on the car for a while, start talking crap. Yeah, certain sections. I've seen, I seen a bunch of that stuff I do have, too. Look me up, man. What the f*** are you right, talking right. about? What are you doing? <laughs> you know, my family and I can't do anything without, you know, make it turn into a complete competitive <laughs> thing amongst those it doesn't matter what we do bruce is really driven he's uh he's pretty pretty sneaky when it comes to to chassis stuff he's always working on that car he'd be reading books he'd figure stuff out on his own and it's always impressed me that he's just like a he's like a macgyver with auto racing he's one of the better act style drivers over there as a driver bruce is unreal like if the car is going to give you, say, a 15-2 or a 15-3, he's going to get a 15-1 out of it in qualifying. He's just, he's unreal. He, he gets everything out of the race car and then more every single time on the track. We looked at it as a beneficial for our team to be in a crate division, and we just couldn't wait to get that out car. They're going to turn number three. The 35 rockets its way off turn number four, down to the checkered flag, Bruce Thomas with the win. Here he is, bring it on, Bruce Thomas Jr. One of the best things about Bruce is he will try any crazy setup in the car if he thinks it makes sense. You know, no matter how off the wall it is, or sounds, or seems, it's, he didn't care, he was willing to try it. We never went back to the racetrack once, ever, in a late model with the same thing we had the week before. The dude was just always trying stuff to get better. There was a, a small window where he was going head to head quite a bit with Timmy Jordan. And they had some, I think, I don't know if it was bad blood or what, but they, they got into it a few times. You know, those guys, there's no love lost there. Those guys did put on some epic battles. Some of the most epic battles I've ever seen. They battled hard. They both had the best of the best. They both had stout equipment. It was anybody's race at any given point. Fans love it. Some of the drivers may not love it. Yeah, I mean, when, when the people genuinely don't like each other, that makes it that much, that gets it a bit more weight, doesn't it? There was a little animosity. They weren't on each other's Christmas cards list. I don't think we'd go out to dinner together. I don't think we really liked each other personally. If I had to guess, without sugar coping it. There wasn't really much of a rivalry, like, in our shop. We never talked about Timmy. We just wanted to go out there and win as many races as we could, and we really didn't care who we were racing against. Rivalry with any other drivers, definitely a no, because uh, we go out there every week to race everybody the same. The two had completely different driving styles. Timmy was smooth, finesse. I feel like his car had to be perfect for him to beat us. 
The Bruce and Timmy rivalry was awesome. Uh, you knew there was going to be a great show that night between those two guys. Definitely by halfway through the race, everybody was up at the fence waiting. It wasn't a matter of if it was going to happen, it was a matter of when, because they were clearly the class of the field, and they always ended up one and two at some point during the race. If the fans thought it was cool, it's cool, but we never, we never thought there was much there. So he convinced me to come up and look at it right before the season started. When I got up there, it already had my name on the car. So I guess I figured I might as well drive for him, seeing how he already lettered it up for me. Facing the foreclosure news, I had known Terry for many, many years before he actually became involved with the Speed Bowl. So I knew of his character and I knew of his drive. He told me that he was going to make it all okay. I firmly believe that and I believe that every time he said it. I really wasn't that worried because I've known Terry for a long time now and the place had nine lives and Terry always finds a way. He was an amazing guy. For He could create money somewhere I don't know <laughs> but he always managed to pull it out and get the place open every year and so when it's foreclosure time it's you know when I'm hearing about that I'm thinking hey eh, he'll manage to to keep it from happening so the background is this we were the only track ever to get an SBA a small business administration backed mortgage uh, in the finance of a, of a racetrack it was done with Bank United. So we were lucky in that we got a deal to, to happen. And Bank United was a Texas bank that got bought by Washington Mutual. And it was discovered in that, in that transaction that Washington Mutual bought about $150 million worth of bad loans because they were, the due diligence wasn't done correctly and the paperwork was false. We got thrown into that same bucket. Had I known that was what happened, if I knew a little bit more about finance at that point in time, I probably could have gone back to the original Bank United loan officer who she had gone to somebody else at that time and probably gotten her to write it with a, with a different place. It was really a frustrating thing. And the interest rate was very high. I remember that my, in that era, the monthly mortgage was $16,700. So, you know, and that had to get paid, you know, every month of the year, not just during the race season. So, so it, it was a nut crusher. There's been some things um, that have been going on, uh, and now it's come to the point uh, where the foreclosure sign was posted on the property where Waterford Speedball lies. Not good news. Well, no, it's not. It's it's not. It, and of course, we love auto racing, and I know that's been a big concern uh, of a lot of the you know racers over at Waterford Speed Bowl, from the racers to the sponsors, and especially to the race fans that have been so loyal to Waterford Speed Bowl. You know, we just got to keep our fingers crossed and, and hope that something good happens. We are on the line with attorney Jeffrey Godley out of the Norwich, Connecticut area. He has been appointed to handle this public auction, which is scheduled to go off on Saturday, July the 28th. How many people do you have on the list right now that will, will be there on Saturday? We've had at least 15 inquiries. We've got a fair amount from out of state. We've got a number of local people. I would say for this type of sale, there's a fair amount of interest. You're wondering if it's, it's going to end, if it's never going to continue, you know? I know in 2007, Bill Roth was the general manager. He thought that it was in the middle of the season, like in July, and he thought it was over, and he was frustrated because nobody was telling him anything. You know, it was very scary to, to hear your track might be shutting down. It was a second home for me since I was a little kid, you know, and not only you hear stuff in the papers, but you hear all kinds of rumors, and then, you know, you hear enough rumors, you start believing them. I was definitely worried about it, you know, because I grew up there, you know, like I said, my whole life as a kid. and. Just as we started getting good, you know, I was worried about the track not being there anymore. And I was nervous that not only my hometown track that I've been going to my whole life, but also my career was in jeopardy at this point. 
if it does get to a point where track is sold, how might that affect the current lease that's in effect? If there's a lease out there, that lease goes away once the sale goes forward. From your point of view, do you see racing continuing through 07 to the end of the season? I mean, a lot depends on who ends up owning it and whether or not the sale goes forward. And the sale may not go forward. Their attorney left a message. You know, they have some interest in having this resolved before the sale, so it may, it may not take place. It may, you know, they may be able to work it out. Facing foreclosure from Washington Mutual, I had to do something. If Mr. Eames, who's the debtor, makes an arrangement with the bank, they would have to file a motion with the court to have the sale stop. They can do that up until Friday around 5 o'clock. When we had the deal with Harvey, but it wasn't enough to pay off the entire debt. So I replaced that with Rocky. You know, that's, that's when I did the deal with Rocky Arbitel. This couldn't have worked out better because you have Terry Eames who you truly knew had a love for the place and a love for promoting the sport and you had a guy like Rocky Arbitel who you felt like this is a guy who is an absolute supporter of short track racing and doesn't want to see Connecticut lose a short track and it's great for, that he got involved and helped save the place. And the speed bowl was solvent. They didn't have Washington Bank on their back anymore and uh, things really look good. First time I ever saw Jerry Robinson, he ran a legend car, right? Number 29. And I, we heard he had something to do with a, a publishing company, like a newspaper or something. Old guy, really tall, kind of like hunched over, arms really long. He was, I was like, how's that guy getting a legend car? And he drove a Cadillac or something like that, a big four-door car with a hitch on it. And he towed his legend car in with it. Jerry Robinson said he could buy the place, but to buy it, he needed a lease from me. And I wasn't in a particular position of strength, so Bill had been befriended by, by Jerry Robinson. He had Bill Roth come in and work under him. So Bill was this little guy. It was like, it was like a cool combination. Like Jerry was huge, skinny but tall, and Bill was a little guy. He always had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. So the two of them doing that together felt good, and if they could pay me X amount of money, um, you know, while they got their, their stuff together, I could pay the mortgage and, and exist, you know, make a living. Um, and then, you know, look for the next thing to do when, the play, when, when he bought the place. Change the name of the track to the new Waterford Speed Bowl, which really didn't catch on. I don't think anybody ever called it that. Do you know that that season that, that they took over, or Jerry took over, I thought Jerry Robinson was somebody else. <laughs> Until somebody one time, three quarters of the way through the season, said, that's Jerry Robinson. Really? I thought it was the other guy. I don't think Jerry Robinson had that people touch, and uh, which somebody in his speedball office had to have. They only lasted a season together when Bill Roth went back down south. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what happened between him and Jerry that they, they, they had a falling out. So it was Robinson with a collection of, I think Steve Haraka was there and Billy was there. Jerry Robinson, he was an enigma. Like when you approached him, you really didn't know what you were going to get. The man that is running this racetrack right now, Jerry Robinson. Is he here? Nope. Probably never will be. Since he's not here, I'll tell you all right to your faces. I think he's a crotchety old bastard. Okay? You're right. He was a very hard person to get close to. We spent a lot of time together. I was trying to work both jobs, you know, work my job at EB still and still work at the, I was not full time because he couldn't afford to pay me. He didn't want to hire a general manager and they needed one. I was doing more of the marketing stuff, you know, trying to sell advertising and stuff like that. I don't know if that I was the GM. I think what I could say about Jerry is he was a good hearted guy. He loved auto racing and he wore his heart on his sleeve. I mean, his heart was there. He was really trying to make the track uh, run and go. He didn't want to see it close. I don't know if it was with age or, or whatever, but he was quick to fly off the handle, however. He would get real excited. There were some days that I just wanted to go. You know where the radio room is? Yeah. I wanted to go over and sit in the radio room and close the door and just because he ticked me off so much. He wasn't people friendly. He does not like to talk to people. He does not like to talk in front of crowds of people. I apologize for that, and all I can do is ask you to accept him for what he is. I think that was the first 
real sign that the place was on shaky ground because you didn't have, um, or at least it didn't feel like it. You didn't have a solid management or somebody that was, uh, coming into it and being accessible and, um, forthcoming with the competitors and in rallying the troops and saying, this is our plans. This is where we're going. This is what we see for the future. We want you guys to be a part of it. You know, hi, Rob, my name is so-and-so. There was none of that. He was all about making, he was worried, more worried about the ice cream machine running and making machine money up there. He wouldn't allow me to go in the pits. On, on race night, I was not allowed to go in the pits. He just wanted me out front watching the, what was going on in the concessions, and it was really, really hard for me. I mean, I'm, I loved all those guys back there. And uh, so it was really, really hard for me, and I think that's one of the, one of the downfalls that he and I kind of had. It made going to the racetrack miserable because, uh, you know, you just you didn't know what this guy was about. I had no idea what he was about. I had no idea why he showed up at the racetrack because he seemed disinterested in everything that was going on there. It, it just seemed like he was there to ride a golf cart around all night. You know, he didn't talk to anybody. I very rarely saw Jerry Robinson. Once in a while, he might go down pit road on, on a golf cart. But uh, other than that, I never really saw him. I just never saw anything from Robinson at all. No, I don't think I ever said one word to him. No interaction with, with Jerry. Um, obviously, he wasn't the most personable person. You know, and his management uh, was probably questionable at the time. But, you know, it was a place to race, and, and they kept the doors open. And uh, not everybody probably agreed with everything that went on back then, but we still raced every week. There wasn't much Jerry Robinson did right in his time there. He did one good thing in his, uh, in his tenure. He created Wings and Wheels. So that would probably be the, his, his claim to fame. If there's any positive legacy of Jerry Robinson's time at the Waterford Speed Bowl, it was definitely wings and wheels. We had sat around, uh, you know, in that office trailer, we had put the wipe-off board all the way, all the way around uh, one, one room on the end and called it the conference room. And we'd have, uh, so most times, a uh, couple of times a month, sometimes on a weekly basis, I'd put the whole crew together. And uh, Billy Roberts and Pete Zanardi and Tony Leckie uh, and others, we'd sat in there and we dream, we dreamt of a big open wheel only show that would include the supers and everything local and the midgets. Um, Zanardi and I were big midget fans. And, um, but we needed a, you know, we needed a, a, a modified show. Well, at the time, the only, when we talked about it, the only thing to do it with would have, would have been the wheel and modified tour, you know, the, the NASCAR modified tour. And that was just too expensive. The show didn't make sense. But along, in that era, along came Jack Bateman's modified racing series and that that put that modified element in there at a price that was affordable so you could combine the supers and a visiting mod show along with your you know your locals and 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 uh, others wings and wheels was really cool because you know you had the super mods there and it was all open wheel racing more so than anything i thought it was a pretty novel idea going into the event i wasn't quite sure if it was going to work if it was going to be this blowout that that they were expecting you can't have an, a, a regular show and pack the house like they did in the 80s and 90s. And Wings and Wheels or a modified tour event is the closest you can get to that excitement. Seeing that program come together with the Midgets and Super Modifieds was, was pretty awesome. And it said something about the race fan in the Northeast or New England that that many people showed up for that event. So the Wings and Wheels from 2008, we were at Lime Rock with Matt. And that race always went Saturday morning, like probably 10 a.m. And Tapley and I decided we would rush back and try to catch this Wings and Wheels event. We thought it would be pretty neat. And it was way cooler than I ever thought. it. I mean, the place was mopped. We had to park at Critical, walk over. I was late getting to the first one. So I got down there later in the evening, and I just remember pulling into the parking lot and thinking, oh my God, I never expected this. I knew it was going to be a big event, but... This is ridiculous. I do remember the place absolutely mobbed. I don't think you could fit another car in the pits and, or another person in the grandstands. First Wings and Wheels was awesome. It was a really cool idea. It was really cool to see it work.
I remember 09 very well because we actually came back to the field and was able to pass Ronnie Uhas towards the end of that race. There's nothing better for a competitor than to run strong on a day where the crowd is in the house. When you drive out of the gate, and you can see everyone's in the grandstands. Yeah, it's, I don't think it changes the way you do anything, but you notice. The supers are unbelievable. It's got so much downforce, so much power, so much grip. It's almost like an asphalt version of the World of Outlaws or something. It's such a cool looking car. The super modifieds are so fast and so exciting to watch. There's no other division that when they're there, you watch their practice, like you have to watch their practice. When they were on the track, you were watching no matter what. There's no doubt in my mind it's a behind the scenes mastermind of bringing in that many fast, badass race cars the crowds were great, car counts were awesome, so yeah, it was an awesome show. It was unreal how many people were there, and it was just a really cool show. The grandstands are usually packed, and it's just like, it's just like a whole vibe. As far as the show itself, it was just phenomenal. It was, you know, great to see that kind of stuff. So, I knew the event was coming up. It was something we had talked about doing. I wanted to see how they made out. The only two seasons that I wasn't there was 07 and 08. You know, they had a three-year lease uh, for 07, 08, 09, and an option to buy it. Robinson was paying well enough that I could keep Rocky paid current. But what started to trip us up with, with Rocky was Robinson failed to pay the property taxes on time. And there was a clause in the, in the financing that said uh, we would be in default if we didn't pay the property taxes as current. You know, there was all these, these big deals that he was going to buy the track. He went and negotiated directly with Arbitel through another guy by the name of Greg Mackin. They spoiled the relationship between me and Rocky. That group led by Robinson tried to do an end run around me, and uh, it became adversarial at that point. Did you ever think that he was actually going to buy the place? I did, and I was terrified of that fact. But yeah, I did, because I knew the, the straits that Terry was in financially. And I don't know what the deal was. You know, I only heard conversations on the side. I wasn't directly involved. I think Jerry took bad advice from a lot of guys, to tell you the truth. So the people have always been a big uh, attraction for me. The cars going around the track are exciting, uh, but there becomes a sameness to that after a while. But the people I really enjoy, for the most part. So that was high among the things that was a miss for me. Uh, what I didn't miss was Mother Nature. You know, I, I, I didn't miss having to worry about the weather. And there was a certain group of people I didn't miss. You know, that really made life miserable, displeasurable uh, to, to be there sometimes. You know, you'd, you'd have what looked like a great race meet, and then, you know, I'd, I'd be at the, at the exit gate thanking everybody and, and just take some irrational ration of you-know-what from somebody who clearly didn't have a clue of what had gone on during that night. But a big turning point was that Wings and Wheels Day, um, August of 08, when I, I brought Yocasta there. You know, I met my current wife, in, you know, during my hiatus. She was very impressed with the place. In a weird way, there was a lot of people that had been annoyed at Terry for certain things before he kind of walked away. Jerry almost got those people more mad to the point where Terry coming back was almost, they were happy about it, even though a lot of them were still mad at Terry for things that had happened before the Jerry era. And everybody seemed to be saying, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? When are you coming back? And she observed how badly 
run the food service operation was and had some experience in that area and said, you really need to take this back over. So I go from, you know, a former situation with somebody that absolutely couldn't stand the place to somebody that wanted to, you know, work alongside of me in the, in the place and, and take it back on. I said, well, if you want to run that end of it, that's not an area that I, I was able to be particularly strong in and do everything else. Uh, let, let's take a crack at it. People need to know that if it wasn't for Yocasta's faith in me and the, and the success of that place, it would be a Coca-Cola distribution center right now. I turned down good money from Coca-Cola. Uh, it would be the Coca-Cola distribution plant right now, and I wouldn't be broke <laughs> if, uh, if I had just taken that money. Um, but I said, you know what? I'm going to make this thing survive as a racetrack and leave it to my kids. And I believed I could do it. And um, yeah, I was re-energized. He was more or less playing this overall manager's role of just kind of sitting back and delegating responsibility to people, which I thought was a good thing. I finally had reached a, uh, an age of maturity, I guess, where I really could embrace delegation. In his previous time at the Speed Bowl, he had so many things on his plate and worried about everything that he was just running around like a chicken with his head cut off every Saturday night because he was trying to put out fires at, on every level. You know, if it wasn't concessions, it was the ticket booth to something in the back, and he could never keep up with it. And now he had kind of delegated responsibility out to a number of people. So we decided that winter of 2008 and 2009 that I was going to go on and lease the racetrack. I want to be careful to not say anything that would make it seem like I'm contradicting how he remembers it. Because we've talked about it, and we do sort of have two different <laughs> remembrances of what went on. The celebration was Sean Monahan was going to take on this role as, a, as some sort of general manager, promoter of the racetrack. In Sean's way, you know, he really was exuberantly excited about doing that. I had put together the banquet for Jerry because he was out and did the banquet that year and was starting to put all the pieces of the puzzle together to start the next season. You know, one pivotal point, I think, was when we went into the banquet that was proceeding that year, and he insisted on getting up at the microphone, and he said, uh, so there's going to be some changes, and, you know, you can count on the fact that one way or the other, there's going to be a clown at the Speed Bowl next season. There's one thing that's definitely going to happen. If you have kids, you'll understand. There's going to be a clown at the track in uh, 2009. I hope you enjoy that because there's nothing worse than some speedy dry. Listen, this stuff has to be cleaned up, but we also got to have some entertainment. So that's number one. We're putting a clown on the racetrack. I hope you enjoy that. <laughs> and I kind of at that point, I became a little uneasy of with the idea of partnering with him. I could not in good conscience follow through on, in, a, in a scenario where I wound up giving him the amount of control that it appeared he wanted. And there was a lot of whispers. Sean would call me and say, I'm not doing it, but I can't tell you why. And Terry would say, I don't know why he's not doing it, but I know he has his reasons. And there was just a lot of secretive stuff about the whole thing and the way it went down. And, uh, and then Sean's out. We knew that Terry was about to go and battle this foreclosure issue. And my understanding through legal advice was that my lease would become null and void if I tried to pursue it, and it went into foreclosure. You know, you could do a whole segment on, on uh, you know, where Shawnee and I have been in our relationship. We're great friends today, but we definitely didn't see eye to eye about how that whole thing would be structured. But what was left, I still thought was a good thing with Brian Darling and Mark Case. Brian Darling had started helping out in the background years before, and he was one of those people who was very critical of, of what I did. You know, he, he had a lot of, a lot of criticism. He did survey work at the Speed Bowl, and we got to know each other through that. And the survey to this day, uh, I remember some of the stats from it, and, and it, was, it was very valuable work. He just became more and more interested in seeing the place survive. He had gotten over the fact that it wasn't me being an idiot that was making it fail, although it was, I made a lot of mistakes, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't solely my, my lack of talent, that there were some other forces that were, were at play here. He came to the party with, with a lot of uh, great ideas about marketing and advertising. Mark Case was racing a mini stock at the time and showed some talent with the internet. We wanted to be state of the art with a, with a website. I needed younger people around me because while I know the power of social media and the internet and all that stuff, I'm not a digital native, so I don't wake up in the morning and have to do a post. 
it, it, you know what I mean? It's, it's, I'm sort of reactionary, not proactive on, on social media. So I, I really needed those guys around. And we figured out a way to just streamline everything. We, it's stuff that we used to spend a lot of money on. We really cut it to the bare bones and, and did it with a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of work. Yeah, the board of directors was a great idea um, to kind of get everybody involved. Everybody's different aspect on the track. And obviously, Tommy was, was great for the track. When the opportunity came that I was stepping aside from racing, I literally said, I'll, I'll put my money where my mouth is and try to get a job and make things better. And I started as a tech guy for Haraka. I would say to him continuously, when you decide to hang up your driver's suit, I need you to come to work for me at the track. And weekly, almost every week, uh, with, with very few exceptions, he would give me his report card on the latest race meet. And I listened to his perspective and uh, I would give him my perspective. So by the time he was ready to to go to the dark side and become with management, we had developed a, a, a joint race management philosophy. Tommy Fox, one of the smartest people I ever met in racing. And I think because he raced both SK Modifieds at the Bowl and late models, he came to that job with instant credibility. And Terry gave me full run. He said, you know, from the minute the gate opens till the lights go off, it's going to be your deal. I thought we were going to hit the ground running. Terry had a spark in him that, that I hadn't seen for quite a few years. I knew that I could assemble the people I needed from a race department point of view. Me and Tommy went to uh, grade school together, actually. You know, so we've known each other a long time. Now, when Fox first came in, he brought Tapley with him. He was his number two. So we're standing there, and I'm like, well, there's no sense for two of us to be standing here in this tower. You know, I said to Tommy, I said, listen, I'm going to go back to the infield. And I think it will really help us out if I bring the quad. He's like, okay, see how this works out. Well, after that first night, he was like, all right, this is what we're doing. Yo, brother, you all right? You're good? You're good? Hey, come over and run his levers. We can roll him out. He would keep the show going by running the infield and getting us back to racing. One thing with Tommy and Scott, you know, you could agree to disagree with them. I groomed him for a couple of years, uh, knowing full well that, that he was going to be my replacement. Great race director, in my opinion. Nobody will ever be perfect in that position, but those two guys took it to another level. Despite all the things that didn't work, our, our management of race meets, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of. I remember more or less seeing him at that point in the golf cart or at the picnic table and you just said you know what he's kind of he's delegated it to the right people and and, and he's put the trust in that they're going to do things the right way and and overall they really did they all were just really great and and you know, costa threw herself into the food service and her whole family uh, jumped in and i really think there was a new air of enthusiasm i got started in racing my father used to race uh before i was even born he raced at plainville stadium it's no longer there anymore but he raced here for many years. And, you know, I was brought up around race cars, brought up in the garage. No matter where he was, he took me with him. My earliest memory going to the Speed Bowl was probably late 80s, early 90s, going to watch my father race. By the time Keith and his brother Jeff grew up, Ronnie was racing very little. You know, I mean, they would have seen him race in the early 90s, I'm sure, as, as really young kids. Definitely 89, 90, 91 definitely brings back some memories. <laughs> Keith Rocco, he was just a cute little twin and his little, remember those shiny jackets when you catch them on the fence, they'd all fray apart? He had those, him and his brother had them black shiny jackets on with the green 13 embroidered across the back. They used to show up to the track and cheer their dad on. My father's trademark at the racetrack was always, you know, show up late. Just about 20 minutes before Concy time, you see that old black and green 13 coming in the gate. They always said he waited under the bridge on 85 till the Conti was getting ready to go out. Prior to a race, we'd just pull out onto the track and whip a donut and then get in line.
roll out the pit gate and blow the famous donut. And the donuts coming out of the pit area. I don't believe that you can learn to be a race car driver. Those guys were born that way but they had some great fine tuning growing up around Christopher and their father. He worked for Teddy Christopher for a, quite a period of time, which is interesting, as did Jeff. I watched Keith when he was a teenager working with Ted Christopher, Keith and Jeff. When we first started with Ted, uh, the guy in the crew, uh, Michael Sullivan, you know, he told us, he gave us some pointers and some, you know, a little bit of education. And, you know, we would do whatever it had to get done, you know, whether it was putting fuel in the car or, or uh, you know, glue and lug nuts, anything, you know, he gave us, you know, an education kind of, of what it took to run a race team. Not only did they learn chassis adjustments from some of the best guys, um, but they learned the ins and outs, the right times to make the move, how to make the move, the, the famous crossover. I think he's a lot more uh, a student of racing than people give him credit for. I think he, I watch him watch other people and I think he's a, an observant kid, you know, it, I think if you sat in the grandstands and just watched him, he's a, uh, you know, he's got a lot of Teddy's traits, I think, because he grew up in an era when Teddy was a guy to beat. Remember that I saw him from the beginning. Keith, uh, how difficult was it? A lot of yellow flags. How, uh, how difficult was it to keep the nerves down? Oh, it wasn't that hard. I had a pedal kind of motor to rely on. I was racing street stocks. I was perfectly happy and content with doing that. And, uh, you know, I won the championship my second year, and I'm like, you know, it'd be great to move up, but the, the chances of doing that are impossible. Well, I got the opportunity from uh, Gene Guy and Bridget Poulin in 2005 to move up to uh, SK. And, you know, one thing led to the next and opened up the door for driving for Bannister Motorsports at Thompson with Shane Hopkins. And, uh, you know, next thing you know, I was running two tracks full time. And then, uh, after racing SKs at the other two tracks, I just really wanted to go back to the Speed Bowl in an SK. You know, I was always friendly with Mark Payne. We raced go-karts together and brawled it out in those, but he called me up and, you know, at that time I kind of had a little bit of a slim chance of a national championship. Not that I really thought I did, but he called me up and he says, uh, you know, if it'll help you with the national standards, he says, you know, we could take my car to Waterford. And I'm thinking to myself, this ain't going to help the national standards, but I ain't passing this opportunity up. So I told him, I said, yeah, it'll, it'll definitely help us. We could make this work. So we, you know, got his car ready. It was sitting for a little bit. And we went down the speedball for, I think, the last six races. By the last few races, we were in contention. We led some races and we just fell short a few times of winning a race. But, you know, from there, after that season was over, we put a program together for the following year that was uh, championship material. I don't say it to be insulting, but when when he started having success in a modified, he really was just kind of a jerk. You know, some people get a couple wins and they're happy they want to ride around. We're never happy. Six wins ain't enough. We're going for more. So what's your game plan for the 100 lap? Our game plan is to win 100 lap. But I think it was because he was so shy that his defense mechanism for not knowing what to say was to just kind of be a jerk and act like he didn't want to be there. So he would come to the press box after races early on, and it was just like, couldn't get anything out of him, and he was just kind of, ang it was almost like he was angry about being there. I think if you talk to the old school who was kind of there before, as Pete already used to call it Speed Bull Royalty, Gata, Jeff Pearl, Rocco was completely different from them. Some people love me, uh, some of my fellow competitors love me, some of them hate me, you know? It all depends on the previous week. When Keith came in, there's, uh, you know, I make no bones about it. I mean, I, did, I did, we butted heads. I didn't like him. Can't say enough for our buddy Rojan Motorsports. He's, uh, he's always the first one to throw us under the bus on the PA, so. It, there was a lot of respect out on the track, and then Keith came in, and he was like a bull in a china shop. Keith was more aggressive than, than Ronnie and us. Rocco was like soda out of a shaken can. He was going to the front. It didn't matter where he started. Hey, Rob, I'm getting a, I'm getting a tough time here for the 57. The 57 says you'll win the championship, but if you're if you're up, he's going to take you out. Yeah, it's all I got the message loud and clear. It didn't matter whose feathers he ruffled, he was out to win races. He wasn't mellow in those days. It didn't happen overnight, but Keith and I are great friends now, and and 
and I enjoy racing against him, but it took some time to get there. Rocco gets the job done. Here is Janovic trying to wrestle second away from Paul. A little smooch to the back bumper of Rocco. It did not seem to slow down Janovic's momentum. Janovic on the inside, Paul on the outside. Great battle for that second position. Meanwhile, up front, it's still Kid Rock. We were leading the race. We had it in the bag. I mean, the car was absolutely awesome. Very few drivers handle the outside groove better than Jeff Paul. High def Jeff sitting in Rocco's lap. Something broke in the back. It was getting worse and worse every lap. Gave up the lead. They storm clawed their way off the fourth corner. Rocco getting sideways. That might be the break that Paul needed. Jeff Paul draws even now, takes the lead down the back stretch. I was able to hold on, and then I started to fade off a little bit. Came in the pits, first caution. So we kind of expected that there would be some strategy, and there it is. Rocco is on pit road. So as he heads to his paddock... They pulled the left rear off, they looked, they said the pan bar mount is broke off the rear, it's ripped apart. A lot of people, including myself, have no idea what a pattern bar is, but it looks like it will cost Keith Rocco the 2009 championship. Right then and there, it was just complete, broke my heart, you know, all the hard work, all the dreams we had, just went out the window. Rod, you said all along, since the start of the season, you weren't, it's too early to start thinking about the championship. When did you start thinking that it might be a possibility today? I didn't know till the end there. I mean, I still wanted to win the race. That's what we're here for. And the points took care of himself. Unfortunately, Keith had some bad luck. And it's just pretty cool because it's, it's a whole, it's the accumulation of the whole year. The Murphy family has, I mean, just awesome car owners. This is for them and all my guys who I think this is the first time for all of us to be here. So it's pretty cool. You know, I always say when I started racing at the Speed Bowl, it, everybody thought it was a joke. But I always said, you know, we're here to win races. That's it. You win the races, the rest comes with it. And that's always been my mentality down there. But in 2010, you know, we just came out of the box on a roar. Oh, he was on an absolute mission. There was no doubt. Because he had come so close the past few years. He was, in the years leading up to that, he had been right there until the end every year. And it just seemed like he got snookered every year at the end. And you could tell right from the start of 2010 that he was on a mission. He had figured out the rules. They had figured out the format. They knew exactly what they had to do. They knew they had to get there first. They knew how the rules work, that if you got to that number first, you were guaranteed the championship. And I, I don't know that I've ever seen a driver on such a mission to just secure one thing like Keith was that year to win the national championship. You know, winning everything in sight from Waterford to Stafford to Thompson. And, uh, you know, we were focused. You know, there was nothing to hold us back. We had all the right pieces to the puzzle. We had all the right people on our team. We had all the right spots. We had everything in line, and uh, 2010 was just a breakout year for us. Once we got into early July that you just knew, he, he's going to get this done, and it's going to be done way early. Keith was nearly unbeatable that year. Just always the fastest car. You, could, you know, he was smoking us in practice. He was just so dominant at the Speed Bowl then that it was almost a foregone conclusion that, okay, he needs one more win to clinch the national championship. They have enough cars here that he gets the number if he gets the win. And you just say, unless his car just blows up or someone just intentionally wrecks him, nobody's going to beat him tonight. The night we won it, it was just... Uh... It was picture perfect, you know, we started in the back, we got the lead early, and it was a day race, just everything was perfect about that day. We were just all in the grandstands, and when he won it, like, it was, it was just so loud and exciting. Jeff just walking around, it looked like, he looked like a clown, his smile was so big. Cassie is just jumping into people's arms, just random people, and she was just jumping around, it was just one of the coolest celebrations I've ever seen. Keith coming 
taking the checkered flag and then blowing the donut in turn one. Coming back in and his dad just slamming the roof of the car like 15 times. And back at that video and it, there's a gleeful giddiness from Keith Rocco that I don't think I've ever seen in any other of his wins ever. That was back when Terry and Yocasta had the racetrack. They had, a, they had a banner, they had champagne for us. That was one of the few times I remember champagne being brought onto the track. You know, everything got sprayed with champagne. Everything was sticky and, you know, um, but it was, it was one of the coolest celebrations of a win that I've ever experienced. And to be right on the track when it happened, it, it, you know, still so much of it sticks out to me. He clinched the national championship like about six weeks before the points ended. So it was a very dominant season that he had. I was happy for him and I was happy that it happened at our track. It's where I started my racing career. It's where I, I wanted any real success or breakouts that I had. I wanted it to be at the Speed Bowl because that's where I started and that's where I learned. He deserved it, you know what I mean? The guy was, you know, you know he put all the work in at the shop and then when it came to Saturday, there was no messing around. So yeah, he was nearly impossible to beat. He's got the whole package. I mean, he, he knows the motors. He knows the chassis, he knows the setups. He's obviously a great wheelman. A really good driver, he's probably the best driver down there. Amazing driver, skills uh, right up there with Teddy. I don't care what anybody says about him, but I, I watch because I'm a driver and I watch him drive the hell out of these cars. And he, 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 he's talented, he's very talented. He's probably the most talented SK driver. You know, he's, he travels all around, wins everywhere he goes. And when he shows up, he's, He's the guy to beat no matter what or where he is. So you got you to gotta call him the best of all time in an SK. I mean, anybody that don't like watching Keith Rocco march through the field, I, I like it when he, you know, for whatever reason, they take the right front off with 10 laps to go and they come back from the back and he wins the race for the night. I, I, I'm a big fan of that. I, I just think that puts people in the seats. It's weird that you never get sick of watching Keith win. He might, he doesn't always have the best car and he still wins the races. You know, he puts that car where you don't, you know, you don't think it's going to stick and he comes out, you know, smelling like a rose and not too many people can do that, you know what I mean? He's definitely a wheel man. He just has such amazing car control that he can just do whatever he wants. He's always in control. He's always in control of that race car. That race car is clearly part of him all the time. The other thing I like about him is a few years ago when he ran three different cars on three nights a week and, and worked on all of them, that's a, a level of uh, desire that you don't see in enough kids, I think, today. I guess he was born too late. Should have been born in the 60s, right? When, when to win the national championship, you had to race 110 times a year. Some kids that come in that maybe have more financial backing or, or come from you know, deeper pocketed family backgrounds or whatever that, you know, maybe that hunger isn't built into them. But I think it was it was built into Keith. And if you had to go work in three different shops in three different towns to race three different nights, well, that was part of the deal and you did it. My driving style probably isn't the most like driving style, but it, it wins races. He's all business, would take chances, uh, very aggressive. Here we, go. Here we, go. Here we had three wins that year, I think, and you know, you think that's awesome. But you, then you think about it, you're like, this guy next to you, he's got 10, it's, or, or 13, whatever he had. To watch him walk around the pits, he seems to be a guy that keeps his eyes open and his mouth shut a lot. I think guys like that tend to go far. You know, if I go back to, you know, Dennis Gator earlier, talking about record breakers. <laughs> 
and there's Keith. <laughs> it wasn't a matter of if he was getting to the front, it was a matter of when. And sometimes, I mean, it was ridiculous. He would start, you know, 15th and be in the top three in a few laps. Bummed out when he passed your SK record? Not really. No. You know it was coming? <laughs> Saw it coming, yeah. At the rate he was winning races, uh, you know, whatever. Record, they say records are meant to be broken, so. Um, yeah, another guy that, uh, just a great driver, um, has a good car and a good motor, so uh, it all comes together for him. He knows how to, now I think he knows more about keeping the car in one piece and finishing races than when he first started, but even when he first started, he was, he's, Still had a pretty good head on his shoulders. But I would also say this, I would suggest that there's been errors when it was like that. Sometimes short, sometimes long. It was an error when Dick Dunn was absolutely the car to beat. And I remember reading in the Cavalcade of Auto Racing that people had gotten kind of tired of it and that kind of thing. And then, of course, it faded out. And then you have that very competitive error for a while. And then Rick Donnelly's error, it was short, 1979. But Donnelly won almost everything that there was to win that year in 1979. And then now, of course, more recently, you have Dennis and you have Keith. And for all we know, that if the speedboat perseveres and hangs on, there may be an error coming down the pike. If, if, let's say, for instance, let's say Keith moves on and goes to some bigger division or something like that, um, it could happen again with another car or another driver. During your career at the speedboat, what driver or drivers, if any, did you have a on-track rivalry with? Oh, God, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> Who's now my son-in-law, right. which is a great friend and, you know, I mean, I was, I was so competitive that I really didn't want to be friends with nobody. Oh! Wow! Now we Wow! As a human being, I, I really like Todd Cerebello. Uh, he is, he's a fun guy to talk to. His father is a fun guy. When I ran Modifieds in 2003, he was the last guy I wanted to be next to. I think he took rights, like really quick rights at the end of the straightaway before he went left, but that was his line. Scary to race with. I knew for him, there's not many people out there that don't mind wrecking or ripping a wheel off if that's what it takes, and he was one of those guys. I could care less if it was my brother in the car. Never mind, Keith. I raced everybody hard. And that's just the way I raced. But when Keith became my son-in-law, and then we became friends, um, things were a little bit different, I, I got to tell you. Um, How so? Well, I didn't want to go in there underneath them when I knew I didn't have a shot at it and blow them up the track and destroy things. Um, where before, I would take that risk. Uh, and, and that's probably one of the main reasons why I'm not, I'm not racing today is because um, I don't want to make decisions on a track based on a relationship, based on money, based on anything. I want to base it on that race. And when that stuff starts getting in the way, you can't be racing. So my grandfather raced uh, Plainville in, in West Haven. And, and obviously I never got to watch him race, and my father really doesn't have many memories of him racing either. Then along came my father helping out Crazy Charlie at the Speed Bowl in what was then the, I guess, the Shookley Stock Division in the mid to late 80s into the 90s. Don't go out So he helped him out for years and we lived on the same street and, uh, you know, we all became real good friends. Now your dad never drove? 
My father never drove. Nope, he always worked on the cars. So how come you never got behind the wheel? Uh, yep. My wife said no. <laughs> she said, if you get hurt, that's it. You're in trouble. <laughs> we would go and watch Crazy Charlie race on Saturday nights, and I just, I, I, didn't, I didn't enjoy it. You know, I would wait up for my father to come home and uh, to see how they did and hope for the best, but I just really never enjoyed going to the track and sitting there all day because obviously I just wanted to watch Chuck race and, and nobody else. Started getting into go-kart racing, we would see it on TV, and uh, we did a little bit of go-kart racing up at Pomfort Speedway. We had fun doing it, and it kind of got me into it. And then we did that for a couple seasons, and that, that kind of just rolled into me wanting to go strictly stock racing. Our first car was Johnny Cambino's car that he raced at Thompson that he actually flipped over and it was just sitting in Apulio's father's Sitco station over in East Haven. My father obviously knows Eddie and his father so he went in there and asked Eddie's father if if what he was doing with the car and he had no intention of doing anything with the car so he said if you want it take it so we took the car and we we put it together and my father spent nights on it Al Stone, when I first started to go to the speedball, he was struggling. In fact, no one in his family, and he was third generation driver, ever had a win. It literally looked like I was cold chuckle out there. I mean, I would hit everything on the track and had no idea what I was doing. I mean, we wrecked a lot of stuff. Again, we didn't have the equipment we have now or the equipment that those guys had then. My father did what he could for me to, to get me involved. Do you remember your first win? I believe it was 05. We raced Billy Gersh for the win. I believe I started outside pole. Right now, we're ready to start our sportsman. Great jump from Al Stone the third in car number 52. He'll lead him down into turn number one, but it's Gersh to battle back down low, side by side. Mark Foley to the inside of the next row as they go. Uh, that's Puglisi now up in the third, moving around Foley. Sean Curtis to round out the top five. Off turn four to complete lap number one. It's the 52 of Al Stone the third out front. He is walking on air after a great run. How about a hand for the winner of our sportsman feature, Al Stone. Winning the first race was great. I mean, Matt Bucker, I tell you, I got out of the car and he was the first guy I seen, the first guy I hugged. You know, it was, it was you know, I was just a kid back then. So. It was one of those times he got that first win and the old cliche, once you get that first win, it comes a lot easier. Well, that was a case for Al Stone. I don't think he won a race the first three years that I was at the bowl, but then he hasn't stopped winning races. And just finally progressively got better and you know, we hooked up with Joe Brockett, which is my father's cousin. He helped us out tremendously getting us going. Well, the year before we had come up a little bit short behind Dwayne. I think we won five or six races that year and, and, and ran really, really well and had very little DNFs or bad runs and you know, put, put together a full season of just great finishes and you know, great luck also. That guy can wheel a hell out of a race car, and, and I'd be the first to tell you, I, I, I watch him, he's so damn smooth, you're thinking, wow, he's, he's not that good, but he, he is that good. He, he, he doesn't get enough credit. Just a steady force, you know, he comes and does his job well, and always with a smile, and, and can crack you up, you know. Yeah, good guy to be around. Stone cold. <laughs> That's what I say to him every time I come see him. Stone cold. Al Stone, stone cold. Al Stone kind of reminds me of myself a little bit, you know, he... Tries to keep the car in one piece, you know what I mean? If you go out there balling the thing up every week, then you got to go home and fix it. That's no fun. And you know what I mean? When you got a fast car, try to keep all four wheels to the ground and, you know, bring that bad boy to the front, and he does that. Another respectful driver, you know, never, never had an issue with him. We always ran each other clean. Super clean driver, always clean on the track. Um, fast, always. Um, I love racing him. He's cautiously aggressive. He very rarely wrecks. Um, he's pretty good at keeping his nose clean, and he's there at the end. Al's not going to pile drive the car in there to take the win if he's got a second place car. And that's the kind of stuff that turns people into champions. He's kind of like the odd man out in that division because when you think of the uh, limited sportsman, you think of banging and sparks flying and stuff. Al is not that kind of driver. I always felt like he was in the wrong division because. It's kind of like a beat and bang division, and that's not Al Stone. He doesn't beat and bang. You know, he's, he's definitely an interesting competitor where he doesn't come off as being an aggressive person, but he could be very aggressive. So he's kind of sneaky like that, you know. I've told him that before. Eddie always says that, why don't I drive these other guys like I drove him? <laughs> You know, 
I remember writing something about Al. It was when him and Puyol were just wrecking each other every week. And it was like, it almost felt like Al was like trying to wreck him. And I wrote something about, did, did Ed Puglio kick Al's dog or something? And Al just wouldn't let it go. It was just hilarious. Like, I didn't kick anybody's dog. I didn't kick anybody's dog. Me and Eddie, it was like, uh, we had like magnets on our bumpers, you know? It was just, Eddie and I were, were those guys that always came together. I did that one. Nope. It was oh. a spring sock. You know, it wasn't anything personal against Eddie. It was just, it always came down to me and Eddie or me and Walter. How about Walt Hovey? Hovey? You mean Shovey? <laughs> <laughs> Street stocks, it's you know, nothing is going to be any better than Hovey and uh, Josh. That battle, it's nothing is any better than that. I really like racing against Josh Galvin, he's kind of like my style, he's kind of aggressive, and it's fun to be able to trade a little paint. Walt and I have traded paint. race what's fun and what's affordable and you know it's good to know that that these veterans you know are coming back i think that's what what cory did and moose and 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 alan and you know and all these guys that come back you know my heart you know always belongs to those street stocks i love those cars just really enjoyed driving those cars and 2011 came around i was like you know i think it's time to make a change we came back full no, almost full time past champions Guys with tons of wins. You have a lot of wins and a lot of championships out there, and it is. it is. It's an all-star race. It was a big division again. Heavy hitters up front all the time. That was really, really fun. What would I be doing if I wasn't racing? Biting my nails. <laughs> I got a race. The second title for Plymouth. The first came a few years back in the mini stocks. Pits, our guys, my crew was there trying to fix his car. You know, my father and Joe Brockett and my guys were there helping them try and change a patrol arm that was stuck in the car. And we didn't think it was fair to him to get caught up in somebody else's mess. So we did what we could to get him back out there. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to get out there in time. much rather be friends with Eddie outside the track than race him on the track. <laughs> I'm glad he's retired right now. I'm gonna say Puglio is the hardest I've ever had to race. He doesn't get shook. So nine out of ten times if you put someone in an awkward position, they're gonna they're gonna fall back and you're gonna make the pass. Eddie, I could never shake Eddie. Eddie was tough to beat. Oh,
now that it's all over and you are a champion. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite a bit of weight lifted off my shoulders. I was thrilled for Walker when he got the championship and he was able to win the last race. I think Corey's one of the best in Connecticut. If you're coming through the field and Corey's in the lead and you get up to second, are you more jammed up to chase him down because it's Corey? Yes. You know, I think of Josh Galvin against Corey Hutchings. That was a ferocious battle. Two guys who would do everything to win. Down the back stretch. Josh Gellman has it by half car length. On the top side of the steep ball track surface. It's Corey Hutchins going to hang on. Probably a lot like me. As soon as you get the helmet on, it's, there's no friends anymore. <laughs> Loved watching Josh Galvin race. He, he's a guy that is always going to put on a show, and uh, you could tell he's another one of those guys that when he's out there and he's behind the wheel, he's leaving nothing on the table. He's he's, gonna, he's putting it all out there. Josh Galvin was one of those guys that live by the sword, die by the sword. You know, he would get into you. You get into him, he didn't matter. He wouldn't be pointing fingers. To him, that was racing. Oh, he got him back! Hey now! Him and I, we just we battled real hard together, and uh, you know, we kind of come to an agreement that we're, we're both thick headed and you know, we both want to win just as bad as the next guy. So we, we kind of toned it down with each other, show a little bit more respect for each other. People always called Corey and I like Arch. Nemesis, but I think it's just, uh, I think it's more of a huge respect on both ends. 2014 season, there was a few things different about the, that season. It was the first time we ever brought our car to another shop, Vinny Beetle's shop, and Eddie Julio housed all the cars there, and he did a lot of work on my car in the off season. It wasn't so much of a job or like, it wasn't so serious all the time. It was, it was just, it was fun and that fun just created wins. When he won the championship, he did what he needed to do. He had an extremely fast car. Those guys never stopped working. And uh, I have a ton of respect for Josh and his driving ability. When I talk about the goal, Josh Galvin, Galvin is number 18. Man, Waterman is fast, huh? Yeah, he's fast. 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 Yeah, he's
So here's a funny story about Al. And I don't know if it helped him or hurt him, but the car that I'm driving today, I helped my cousin Jesse build. And we brought it up on a practice. And Al and his dad were there practicing with their car. And I had uh, Al take out Jesse's car. I'm like, take this out. Let me know if the brakes are good. Is it steered? Does it do its thing? Blah, blah, blah. And Al went out on the racetrack. And within a couple, two or three laps, he's in the outside groove passing people. And I'll be honest with you, I had never seen Al up there before in his entire life. When he came back in, he told his father, I wish my car turned like this one. And, uh, I, you know, racing is a lot of times you're out there trying to hit a target where you don't know where the bullseye is. And I think putting him in a car that actually turned and the brakes worked and everything did what it was supposed to, he realized what he was shooting for. He learned where the target was. And from that point on, he just kind of takes off. And, uh, you know, he had his own error. Glenn Coleman, one turn away, had the Coleman motion. It's ridiculous. Wow. My, I remember my first impressions of Kenny and seeing, like, he he looks like, he looks mean, I guess. The, my first impressions were Kenny was like, he's, he's a mean looking guy. And then, like, the first time you talk to him, he's just like, the nicest guy you want to meet. I, I, I love Kenny Cassidy. He's got to be four or five years younger than me because he was just a little kid when his dad was running street stocks. Cassidy heading to victory lane for the fourth time this year. I remember him as just running around in the grandstands and stuff. That's what I remember about Ken Cassidy. Number 11 is headed to victory lane. Starting deep every week, 15 laps. He got to the front, got the job done. He was a little rougher than I was, but you know, he won some races. Growing up at the Speed Bowl was, you know, was awesome as a kid. It was a group of us sat in the grandstands every week, same spot. Dad called me one day and said, you know, you want to go race? And I said, I've been waiting you to ask that question my whole life. You know, watching Cassidy, you know that no matter where he starts, he's just gonna smoothly pick his way to the front, and it's kind of cool watching him make history each week. I never thought Darnstead's record was gonna get broken. This is another Brett record. He's got 11. He's tied with him now, so if he wins, he'll have 12. Got it. Got it. Know Dan's Have you ever talked to him since that record's Um, not really talked to him too much. He texted me, I think, uh, on Facebook, and he's like, you, you got it. You know what I mean? He's like, I, I never thought that record was going to be broken. When I tied him up with 11, he's like, you know, he started to get worried. He's like, that record might be in jeopardy now, you know? History has been made at the Speed Bowl. 12 victories in a year. No one had ever done that before today. And here is the man whose name is in the record book. Cassidy, Jr. We set a lot of records that year, you know, 12 wins in one season. That, we broke that record I thought was never going to be broken. And uh, won the national championship to go to Charlotte and get recognized, you know what I mean, as a national champion. That's, that's pretty cool. Off turn, number four, 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 When Garrett Denton came, it didn't take him long to start winning.
Another guy I always loved watching race was uh, Ray Christian III. There's plenty of times I thought, watch it from my pits, you know, it's always like, wow, he's gonna take down a turn four fence. He, he didn't, but you know, he always, he just, you could tell, one of those guys that left it all on the line every time he went out there. When I remember Sean Karen, I don't remember him winning that many races, but I remember the way he raced and those exciting battles between he and Cassidy. Now, an incredible beat battle at the front. This time it's the 11 out front. For all attention, at the front of the field, almost third time for one. This is going to be uh, 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 what a great race. A case where he was very, he did the right thing and uh, didn't outgrow his budget, stayed in the mini stocks, but kind of lamentable in a way because he had more talent. He's one guy that I say, man, I wish that someone would just buy an SK Modified and say, we're, we're putting you in this just on pure talent alone because you know how to get around here. He's one of those guys that you say, man, I wish someone would just put him in a car just so we could see what he could do because he's so good. That's one person I think deserved to, to do more. Do things in a bigger arena. Two guys come up, one says you can drive my late model, the other says I can you can drive the SK, which one are you picking? I'm taking that late model. You know, a lot of a lot of guys love that, you know, SKs and as a kid, I mean, I watched them but I was always been a fender guy, you know, street stocks, mini stocks. Yeah, you know, my dream car is a late model. Maybe someday. He's one of those guys that the support divisions don't have enough guys like this, but Support divisions can always be the struggle when they come to the press box after winning because they just, a lot of those guys just don't get interviewed enough that they don't, they don't get it when they get up there. And Kenny like gets it. He comes up, he's relaxed. He's awesome. He, uh, f he could big time people. And I know he's just a mini stock driver, but he's been so successful that he could be kind of the big time badass. And he's not, he is the nicest kid you want to meet. I'll say one thing about Ken Cassidy. He won five championships, the all-time win leader, and everybody likes him. Kenny's always ran everybody clean. Ken Cassidy's one of the cleanest racers I've ever seen. He was another guy that was never afraid to put it on the outside. And I always loved how everybody, even his competitors, really respected and genuinely liked Kenny. And I've been able to hang out with him outside of racing. Really good dude. Kenny reminds me of my type of driver. Smooth, calculated doesn't stir the pot, doesn't poke at the fire, just goes out there consistently. And uh, if he's got a fifth place car, that's where he's gonna finish. He doesn't try and make something happen that's not gonna happen. If he has a third place car, he finishes third. And if his car's on, he'll win the race. But he doesn't overdo it, and it makes him a really good shoe. He's always respectful, obviously, because he'd end the year with the same body and no scratches on it, so. <laughs> I let my driving do the talking on the racetrack, you know what I mean? Like I don't go around talking like I'm better than you, you know what I mean? I'll prove it on the racetrack if I can, you know? <laughs> In a sport where the more success you have, the more animosity you create. And they, Ken Cassidy is probably one of the more popular guys in the, in the pits, despite all his success. Kenny is one of the best mini guys I've ever seen. NASCAR had a, um, an improvement program where they would choose, I think it might have been two or three tracks a year, and, and they'd send you like $10,000 to do some physical improvement. So you had to kind of write a grant application for it. I don't know if they still do it, but they, you know, they did at the time, and, and uh, it really came in handy. We didn't cover the entire cost of the straightaways with that, but we, we got close. Actually, in New England, people look at you strange in the trade, you know, if you're in the paving business, if you pronounce the G. Everybody says Millens. But it's it's really the remnants of when they use a milling machine to grind off the top surface of the highway. And then, um, because if you just keep paving a road over and over and over again, it becomes too thick. It, it, it's not stable. Plus, it won't clear the bridges after a while. If trucks won't clear the bridges, if you just keep putting coat on coat on top. So you have to mill that off. And sometimes that stuff is available in surplus. So right from the very start, I mean, going back to before I even uh, took the place over, there was a veteran fan that was in the trucking business and he'd steal me a, a few loads of, of millens uh, off of some project and, uh, and dump them over there for, for nothing. It took us a while to get to that sweet spot with the town to where they'd kind of do a combination of uh, don't ask me that question or look the other way or come up with a creative answer. You know, people don't realize because we never were able to do 
some big demonstrative thing like, oh, here's a brand new concession building or a brand new this. The minimum I ever spent was $50,000. Most years, it was more like $100,000 on maintaining that place. It was my vision to keep that wooden grandstand there in perpetuity. It's kind of like a steel, a steel roller coaster versus a wooden roller coaster. I believe that the wooden grandstand was the better option. And I had an engine in those last couple of years, I had an engineering firm. They were willing to sign off on a year by year renovation of that wooden grandstand. And I would have never torn it down uh, because I knew that it would start tipping over a bunch of zoning dominoes and the place would change forever. One of the things I would have done had I stayed there is actually covered it in the wintertime because now you can buy these giant tarps like you see at the big tracks where they take empty sections there and they turn them into advertising now. That product is less expensive now by far than it was back in the day. So my plan was uh, if you flew over it in the off season, you'd actually see, you know, speed bowl, <laughs> you know, spelled out the length of the grandstand. And by doing that for six months out of the year, we'd get that much longer out of the, the deck boards as we went along. Everything we tended to do, it didn't get us a big bang for the buck. You know, it, it was, it was all, uh, you know, fancy underwear, not a, not a new suit coat, <laughs> you know. NASCAR, they started conversations about Gee, you know, would you like to talk about a date again? So they, they had suffered some, some real scheduling problems and uh, they had some personnel changes, people taking a fresh look at it. The only reason they dropped the race is because NASCAR took their date away from them. They gave the date to somebody else. It was Martinsville. I think they gave it to Martinsville. He said, I ain't going to say the words to you. He said, well, how will them? If I can't have a good date, I'm not going to take a shitty date and start building my whole thing. He goes, screw them, I'm done. And would have liked to have come back twice, but I said, no, you know, you, you took that Labor Day event away from me. And I, I said, you'd never come back on that date. And I kind of stuck to that and felt that the conservative deal would be to just run them once. And I said, I can't do it at the full purse that you want to do. So George Silverman was the guy in charge at the time. And he said, look, I could do a trim down purse, but we'd have to limit the race length to X number of miles. So you know, we were in NASCAR terminology, we were a three-eighths mile track. So that worked out if you took the number of miles and divided it by 0.375, it came out to 161 laps. So we announced that date concurrent with the banquets in Charlotte. So we're on a shuttle bus and I happened to sit across the aisle from Doug Kobe. And he said, hey, I saw that you guys are doing the, you know, doing a, a tour race. That's really good. But he said, 161 laps? He says, you got to think of something to do that with that, like, you know, like maybe make it a tribute to Richie Evans. And that's, I, I give him full credit for that idea. I said, that's a great idea. And I was on the phone with, you know, with, with Darling and Case from Charlotte saying, start thinking about how we make it the, you know, a, a Richie Evans Memorial. Not only did they bring back the tour, but they named it after Richie Evans, a Richie Evans Memorial. And I think that added. Uh, luster. The Evans thing, you know, he had, the, he had a little bit of a gimmick, a little bit of a gimmick, but he promoted it. There was this feeling that Terry was going to turn things around there, that Terry was going to get himself out of the trouble he was in. And that was kind of the marking post of, wow, we're on, we're on this road to it. This is, this, it's going to happen. Everybody got behind the idea. It was like, wow, Waterford having a tribute to the great Richie Evans, run by a guy who had never met Richie or seen Richie race. It, uh, it was kind of a thing of beauty. It had kind of a, almost a Funk Master Flex vibe to it. The biggest thing about that was the buzz um, leading up to that and the day of. You could see the parking lot was already filling up. You could see the cars were already there. You know, like, it's like, wow, this is pretty cool. You know, it's, you knew there was, you were witnessing something that was different. You got to the track knowing that it was going to be a special day. Yeah, it was one of the best nights that I've been at the Speed Bowl. There was electricity that night awesome vibe that night because you know everybody especially in new england you know the nascar wheel modified tour is where it's at and uh the bowl is a great venue for it you just knew it was going to be a good day it felt big it felt, felt like it felt like a really big night i think it was really exciting especially for the diehard speed bowl fans you know they all wanted to see them every year you know what i mean it was a a shame when they they stopped coming there was this feeling like something was coming back that hadn't been there for 50 years and the vibe i mean it was just it, it it, it was, I call it firing on all cylinders. The night that the tour was there in 2012, I was racing that day and they asked me to sing the national anthem that day. So I think somebody backed out 
on singing the national anthem or no show or something. And they had heard that I sing. Um, I do not sing professionally by any means. This is just like, I'm just like a karaoke type girl. Like I do it for fun and I'm like decent at it. So um, when they came and asked me, I was a little bit sassy. I was like, "Mm, I don't really want to do it. You're just going to get me all nervous and I'm here to race. But I did it and they brought me out there on the golf cart. And we are delighted to have with us tonight to perform the national anthem, the driver of car number 56, Nicole Borgello. It was awesome. The vibes were awesome. The cheers and the stands, it was it was it was so awesome. I was like, wow, I can't remember the last time there was this much excitement at this track. And on the back fence, they had the Richie Evans 61 painted with Mr. Reuter. And it really looked pretty pretty good. It had only been six years at that point, but it was this massive celebration. It was just mobbed. It was packed. You couldn't get a seat. I had never seen the grandstand so packed. And as it turned out, it was a great race on top of it. I remember the race was uh, a barn burner. Doug Colby got into it at the end with Ryan Priest. Doug rooted Ryan out of the lead. Two laps to go, green, white, checker. What was your strategy? Knock the 16 in the door and hang on for two laps. I'm pretty sure we'll be coming back here next year and I hope we're gonna be the one in victory lane next year. And you had this feeling that, you know what, maybe next year it'll be the other way around, which it turned out to be. A lot of promoters say, you know, you really don't know what event's going to be like until you run it three years in a row. I kind of had the opposite uh, experience in that almost always the first time out of the box, you never could, you know, it's kind of like first kiss. You can never get, get back there again. I remember leaving there and saying to myself, can this happen every year, you know? And it, and it was, it didn't, it wasn't replicated. You know, it's still a big event. It's not that it declined badly, but... That first year, just everything just kind of clicked. That 2012 Return of the Modified Tour was one of those special events that, well, I don't know that it will ever be replicated. The biggest thing I remember about that night is uh, being out in the parking lot after the event with Doug and a few other people, a few other luminaries, you could say, from the Modified Tour. Doug Kobe and Brian Crowley and Rich Keeter, all three wearing Race Day CT t-shirts. And we were taking the picture as the sun was coming up. I think it was about 6 a.m. when we took the picture. And we, we partied pretty late into the night. But that, I mean, that parking lot that night, it was amazing. It was like the Speed Bowl had come back to life, you know. Right. The parking lot was just bursting um, at the seams with people. And it was like everybody was getting along. It was, uh, it was all the regulars of the Speed Bowl and all the regulars of the Modified Tour. And everybody came together. It was this big stew. And it was just, it was like Mardi Gras at the Speed Bowl. The party after, I think, was one of the big ones. Uh, I think uh, the winner, Doug Kobe, might have saw their son come up the next day. It was, a, it was a crazy night. The car flipped. The young kid who flipped his car at 2 in the morning right outside the Speed Bowl. Yeah, a car flipped over on the road. And these guys were in the parking lot. And they went and they, they put the car back on its tires. All of a sudden, he has... You know, 37 friends out there to help him 
flip his car back over before the cops got there. You know, who could call, why did he need AAA when you have Doug Kobe? It was so many crazy things about that night. We started out in Corbett's uh, 1996. Uh, my dad got me a car and uh, we went racing and uh, we raced at Little T-Speedway full time. And we did some of the bigger shows at uh, Silver City, Meriden, Connecticut. Good thing about Corbett's is what it taught me the most is how to drive in traffic. And um, especially with the open wheel, it was, you know, open wheel Corbett's to an open wheel modified. It just, it taught you that you can't lean on people. You didn't pick up any bad habits. Tyler came out of the Gata shop, his father, was tight with the Gators who used to work on David's car. Actually, my dad, he bought a car before I turned 16 and had Dave drive it for, David Gata drive it for a couple of years. We had to wait till I was 16 because the rules at the time were I couldn't even get in the pits yet. So I remember Rob uh, Genevick was practicing my car on a Thursday night and I was watching through the fence because I still couldn't get in the pits yet because I was 16. Rob was a huge mentor to me as he, you know, he helped me out a ton when I first started going. Obviously, I've, as he's my godson, I've watched him like every step of the way. Tyler won a bunch of, of races, so normally you would think, okay, he's probably going to be good. Tyler's awesome. He's a, he's a good kid. Now, uh, when we first started doing the Wednesday stuff is when he came out in the next mod. In fact, he was probably the most successful graduate of the X modified program my first few years was a huge learning curve um a lot of ups and downs there was nights where i was kind of fast but i i had so much to learn one of the tyler's first races he's going head to head out there with bo gunning i was a huge fan of tyler from day one he beat bo gunning out of a concy i mean not i mean they're banging in each other he's not giving you know he's not he's not rolling over for a veteran and i was like wow you know, this kid knows how to stand up for himself. He was so excited to beat Bo out that day, though. That was, was a fun day. It was intimidating at first, you know what I mean? Because he's I was going out there with guys that I had been watched, you know, I watched racing growing up. You know, there was Ronnie Uhas, Rob, uh, Tommy Fox. I mean, it was a heavy hitter field. Jeff Pearl, and, they, you know, there was a lot of old guard. There wasn't much young guys in the SK yet at that point. Uh, I remember watching Tyler when, when he was fresh and new and a rookie to the division, and... Um, he wasn't that great himself, you know, and, and as, as I wasn't that great in my division. Tyler didn't start out by, by knocking him dead. Then in the tertiary layer of action, it is Frank Lucicero, but almost hitchhiking to the back of that car is Tyler Chadwick. Pretty late into the race, and I hadn't been up that far that long in the race at that point yet, and, uh, Kind of got caught in a little lap car action, and uh, I came off a of turn four and one, pulled off one of the biggest overcorrections probably in Speed Bowl history. Uhas now has Tyler Chadwick between he and Chadwick gets out of control. Chadwick hitting the wall, making contact with Pastriac. Vicious hit between Chadwick and Pastriac. I just so happened to clip Chris when he was trying to clear through it, and I felt really bad. Basically destroyed both our cars. As he could not Houdini his way past Tyler Chadwick, who uh, just jackknifed his way across the racetrack to the Arco barrier. Tyler, I like him a lot better now than I did five years ago. As a young kid getting into the Modifieds, I kind of got the, the, the cold shoulder a lot, you know, just young. It was, and uh, the old guard didn't really like me that much. He's changed so much from when he first started. Speed Bowl Banquet at the old Groton Inn. He says, I can compete with Rocco. He says, you don't, you don't think I can, but I'm confident I can compete with him. Sure enough, he didn't win the championship that year, but he won it the next year. Two thousand twelve, it was amazing. See, you know, anybody knows in racing to win a championship, most everything's got to go your way, and not just on Saturday nights. It's got to go your way Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in the shop all week long. And that season, we just so happened to be in the right place at the right time, and we were really fast. Wow, Tyler, nice power move up high. I would race by, you know, next to him side by side and I know there's not gonna be an issue. Coming down to, you know, racing a KG vet, like vet, uh, Jeff Pearl, you know, I'd watch him when I was little. I knew it wasn't gonna be easy. I remember the last Saturday night of that year, before the finale, we had double features, and uh, we won the first one. So I'm thinking, all right, night's going good, we got a little cushion. 
we have some bad luck in the, the second feature and Pearl's leading the race. And I remember Warren coming over the radio and he goes, Pearl smoking, Pearl smoking. And I'm like, oh, he's in the lead, what happened? What happened to Pearl? What happened to Pearl? What happened to Pearl? No way! What's going on here? Whoa, whoa! He ends up getting hit by a lap car and that's when I kind of, you know, that never happens. Very, very rarely does that happen. And that's when I had a real big confidence going into finale weekend that things have been going our way this year. It's going to continue, I hope. It was awesome to go down to the last race and uh, be able to bring that home. Time to beat our champion for 2012, Tyler Cadwick! As much as I wanted to win it, I didn't have a problem with him winning. As a driver, I don't think he really gets the credit he deserves. I mean, he did win a championship. I always appreciate the guys that don't have the big sponsors that and it's the family of Tyler and his dad. Good group of guys, yeah. My championship crew from 01 is with Tyler, Warren, Jimmy Dupont. It's kind of cool. He's pretty good at keeping it low key and staying under the radar, and then before you know it, he's winning. You know, he's winning these big shows. My racing career began, um, I was about five years old, and I started in quarter midgets. I raced at Silver City um, against Joey Logano, Ryan Priest. Then I moved on to sprint cars. Um, I raced at Whip City. I won a championship in the 600 division. After my championship, we got into the Modifieds, and um, we started at Stafford in 2009. Really, we just needed seat time, so I had two race cars and we were just switching tracks and I was racing three nights a week sometimes. The SK Light division was fairly new at the time and we watched them and I thought that's what I was going to start in but at the time they were like a wreck fest and my father told me I'm, I'm not going to spend all this money and I'm not going to put you in a rookie division. So if we're doing this we're going full-blown SK racing like you're either doing it or we're not and we did it. I did pretty well, definitely hung with the best. Nicole Morgillo was a controversial figure. A lot of people uh, question her driving style. Nicole was kind of that, she had that badass attitude that I don't care what you think of me. Let's talk about the world famous meltdown. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think I was in third and I was going for second off of the restart and I was fast. This is exciting. I'm about to get a podium finish on like a big race and freaking Ted just spins me in front of the entire field. I literally climb over my car. I broke the freaking fuel cell tin in because I climbed over it. And I'm looking for him and I'm like, where where did he even go? Like I couldn't even find him. And then I spot him and he's down in turn two and he's giving me the finger. So. Hold on, hold on. Here we go. Mega meltdown. I ran down the track and I got to him and his finger was still hanging out his window net. So I grabbed his finger and I bent it backwards and I gave him peace of my mind. <laughs> you know, she got out of her car and chased Ted Christopher down and you're like, this, this girl's different. You know, there's nothing timid about her. The only thing I could think of was Teddy. I know he was laughing. Like he was like, what's this chick doing? Do you have a relationship with Ted off the track? Um, yeah, like we would talk a lot here and there. I would go down his shop and bullshit and, you know, I bought wheels from him. So I would hang out and chat. And literally I went over there for a wheel like right after that incident. He was like, hey, I didn't know if you were talking to me or not. Yeah, really miss that guy. As a photographer, you're 
you're, you enjoy shooting, but you also enjoy seeing things that are unique. You know, things that cannot be duplicated. Like to see Nicole win and then see Victoria win. I mean, how many times has that happened? One time. It may never happen again. I remember like it was yesterday. My mother-in-law came a little bit late and she looked like she had been crying. She looked really stressed out. And I'm, my mom's hooking up my Hans device and she's talking to me and I'm like, Mom, why does Debbie like look so upset? And my mom's like, probably because you're racing against her son. And I'm like, well, what does she think I'm going to do to him? Like, geez. They come up to me in the trailer and they're like, we really want you to sing the national anthem tonight. And I'm like, no, absolutely not. I'm not the fastest one, like, on the practice charts today. Like, we got shit to do. <laughs> Everyone's, like, laughing, but they begged me, like, please do it. It's good karma. Just do it. And I'm like... Fine, I'll do it. A last minute change of plans because we had to do some scrambling and we appreciate that Nicole, even though she has a big race tonight, she has agreed to help us out. And then Sean gets on the back of the golf cart and I'm like, why are you coming? You hear me sing all the time. He's like, cause I just wanna hear you sing. What's the big deal? I'm like, okay, don't know why we gotta be so extra about it. He comes out there and uh, they go to give me the microphone, but instead of giving it to me, they give it to him. And I'm like, what, is he going to introduce me? Like, what's going on? So why don't we give the microphone to Sean Tebow? So there is a bigger reason why you're up here. For those of you who don't know, uh, I've been with Nicole for about seven years now. Um, it's been nothing but amazing, and I'm hoping to uh, keep those years coming. So will you marry me? And he gets down on his knee and he reposes. I was shocked, but at the same time, it was all like coming together. No wonder like Debbie was crying or just like looked sad. <laughs> uh, um, so he proposed to me and that was really exciting. And then I like was shaking and I'm like, yeah, I hope you don't need me to sing the national anthem because I cannot perform now. <laughs> so, Am I really singing the national anthem? No. <laughs> Victoria, she was actually a bridesmaid in my wedding. So she is one of my best friends. Um, I'm really close with the family and John. John Burganti, one of the more colorful personalities in racing. You know, her father made sure that she knew a lot about the cars and stuff. So she was pretty knowledgeable. She had been racing SK Lights for quite a few years. When both Victoria and Nicole came along, these were, these were uh, ladies that showed the talent to be able to, you know, to go elbow to elbow with, with the guys. She was out in the SK Light race and she actually took down a win. She's got it. The first female driver ever to win a NASCAR nice. win a win to the people. That's a good moment right there. It was so exciting. We were all screaming, going crazy. And when she did that, like, I just had this feeling like I'm gonna win. And he ends up breaking. And I'm like, dude, something's happening. Like, this is going to happen. Hiya, hiya. I'm in the lead. We have like 10, 12 to go or something. Teddy was 
pounding on my bumper, pounding on me. Like, you could feel every single bump. God, he's gonna wreck me, he's gonna junk me. And I'm thinking, you know what? <laughs> with the, with the, their past history, you know, maybe I'll just win this by default, you know? And... Oh, yeah! The car was on. I mean, there's no doubt about it. She was able, you know, she's always, she was always able to get the car around the track. I think you're gonna pull it off, dude. You're gonna pull it off. You're gonna get it. We got it. We won. And uh, my family was there. My mom was there. She has tried for a long time. <laughs> and Sean, like, stopped his car on the track and ran and gave me a hug. And it was awesome. Sean Timo giving her a hug just like he did at about 7 o'clock tonight. I think arguably one of the most important things that ever happened in the speedball. One of the more unique nights at the speedball. Two girls winning on the same night was, was really, really cool. It was very, very cool that that happened at our joint. Nothing in the world tops that night. When you're out there racing, you're, just, you're racing against another modified. You know, whether it's a male or a female or, you know, it makes no difference. It made no, it never made a difference to me. I don't care what anybody says, like females have to work harder for it. We have to work harder for a lot of things. Um, but being in a man's sport, I mean, there's no other females out there. You're racing against men out there and in race cars all their lives. So it was hard to go out there and be competitive and like to be on the podium was an accomplishment. So being the first female, I mean, I tell people that, like, it just sounds good. Not to be conceited, but like, it's really cool. Jeff Smith, good family, good, good guy. Jeff Smith, he's a good kid. He's a quiet kid. I met him at the bowl when we bought that lay model. We went down to practice and I needed a spanner wrench for the springs and I went over to see him to get a, I never, didn't know who he was. Wayne looked like a kind of grumpy guy. And I'm like, oh boy. So, but they were nice to us and that's when we hit it off. They're stubborn people. I mean, I'll tell you that right now, the both of them are, you know what I mean? And then I am too. So we, me and the old man get along great. I'm telling you. <laughs> big country. Jeff Smith. The dude's just big. Big country. Walk next to that little thing there real quick, just so we can see how, oh yeah, I could take you right out, huh? That's good. <laughs> I like Jeff Smith, you know, but he's so reserved compared to Dylan Maltz and Keith Rocco and Bruce Thomas. I, it's, I like watching those guys. I like it when I think it's Ray Parent, the 17 car, you know, he comes in, you know, and just like that's a car that can win on any on any time he's there. Dylan Moltz, Thrillin' Dylan as we call them, knew that he was good. Holy, Palmer getting a run here. Oh, Moltz gonna throw it in! Moltz gonna throw it in! Five cars to spin in battery. I don't really, he's good, really good, um, just rough. His speedball career was a prosperous one, but not a long one. You 
know, I was able to adapt really well to those cars and then we were able to find a setup that worked really good for me and my driving style and won a lot of races with those cars. When he first started driving late models, it was for Fern. They had some older car and he'd be a top five guy, maybe sneak out a win or two. And we weren't really worried about him much. He was killing everybody in the modifieds, but we weren't worried about him until he got that new car. When they got that new car, they took it to the next level. He's cool. Him and Bruce had a dust up in like the 06 open in practice. Vinny drove right down the side of our brand new car. Didn't wreck us, but made it made it aware to Bruce what happened. And for whatever reason from there on, they've had a great relationship. I'm pretty sure they still talk every single day. Jason Palmer won everything in the book in a legend car. A great legend driver, and I thought when he went in the late models, he would have a lot of success. I don't know what effect it had, because I don't think car counts changed that dramatically. I thought it would work out a little quicker, that car count would come back. Uh, and it never really has at Waterford to this day, at, at the Speedwall it hasn't. I thought at that point the American Canadian Tour was really going to make a run at trying to take over southern New England. The Bush North, k and East, Camping World East, whatever you want to call it over the years, was kind of losing its luster in southern New England. And I really thought the American Canadian Tour saw an opening and I thought Waterford was going to be able to take advantage of that and use them, you know, kind of uh, both use each side to their advantage. But I think as the bowl is concerned, it really didn't make a, any difference. Was it the right thing to do? I think so. Did it work out to, to, my, you know, to my expectation? No. We did not execute well. Um, there was an issue in terms of making sure the restrictor plates were turned in every night as they were supposed to be. Uh, somebody just trusted, uh, my staff just trusted that <laughs> the guys could take them home and they wouldn't modify them. And so there were a lot of, there was a lot of uh, shenanigans uh, in, in the engine area. So Stafford saw that in innovation and said, hey, you know, uh, Waterford's got an idea here. They're, you know, they're, they're onto something here and created the SK Lite. And once they did that, I said, you know what? I'm into rules parity, so let's just fall in with that rule. Another one right out of here. That's the kid that listens to me. That's like my son don't, he does. I think at one time we were talking about rivalries. I think he might have had a rivalry with everybody in the division. I knew the kid was going to get DQ'd. I mean, he was just driving into everyone. Both of them were driving into each other. They are brake checking and everything. I mean, you don't race like that. He gets yelled at a lot by me because he gets himself in trouble sometimes. Like, There were some very colorful exchanges in, in uh, Victory Lane. Very nice kid, very nice family. He was able to win a Legends Championship. looking car pretty fast.
King Kong, Wayne Shiflett. Wayne's a wheel man, he could get it done. Another underrated driver. My brother's driving style compared to mine, I'd say it's very equal, very aggressive. Just want to lead every lap we can lead. Zach picked right up on that. You could do a whole segment on the stuff that Brad has done for that track and his wife. Just being there to support those family fun shows, no matter what I needed to do. Hey, Brad, it's a week away. What can we fill this slot with? Uh, you know what? I, I watched some video about the uh, cars on ski. Okay, I don't know what it is, but let's do it. My number one memory, Speed Bull Bowling at one of the thrill shows, Patrick Williams, when <laughs> and he wound up flipping his car and almost got wedged into the fence. So that was the most spectacular uh, episode of Speed Bull Bowling we saw. I thought I was progressive and innovative when I copied other promoters around the country and adding the second day. And it was a great success. But by the time I got to 2013, I'm like, how do I stuff these 10 divisions or whatever I had back into one day? Because the business had declined so much that I was grossing across two days, what I used to gross in just a Saturday night, but I had the overhead of Wednesday and Saturday to, to pay. So honestly, I do not know why the Speed Bowl runs two days right now, because it's not close to profitable. You know, maybe if you took a back gate only approach to a second night, you know, you could make sense uh, out of it, you know, almost like a glorified practice. But to do a commercial with fans paying a gate kind of thing, there just isn't enough to go around. So let me ask you this. Why didn't you just say after 2013, we're, we're no longer going to have the, the Wild and Wacky Wednesday series? Well, had I survived 2014, 2015, there would have been no Wild and Wacky Wednesday. I moved. Uh, from New England to Indianapolis in 19, at the very beginning of 1997. And I still kept up on anything, on everything that went on back here. We uh, took it into Chapter 11 days before the auction was scheduled. At the time, while the debt was accruing, he needed to do what he needed to do to keep it a racetrack. It's one of those places that um, I've gone back there since 2000, probably... Uh, I don't know, maybe 10 times, 8 or 10 times. And every time, you know, because all these rumors are always out there, part of you, in the back of your mind, you're always thinking, God, I hope this place is here the next time I come back. When you watch something like that happen from afar, you know, when all you hear is the bad news, it never has a good end, or almost never has a good end. You know, the fact that that place is still there now uh, is shocking. There was always, you know... Ever since I started racing SKs there, it was always, oh, the, the Speed Bowl's going in foreclosure. You know, somebody, it's going to get sold. You know, I don't know if it's going to get run as a racetrack. You know, somebody wants to turn it into a condo complex. You heard a lot of rumors that, you know, some big corporation was going to buy it. You heard Harvey, you heard Coca-Cola, you heard Lowe's, you heard UPS, FedEx. Kind of got to the point where it just went in one ear and out the other, and you kind of thought, yeah, you know, this is just going to be an ongoing thing, and Speed Bowl's always going to be here. I really didn't think it was going to go away. It, that place has been there for a long time. It survived a lot. It's tough. And I think it's going to be there for a lot longer. In the weeks leading up to the auction, I really, I really thought he was going to pull it out because he had always pulled it out before. That was, that, that was Terry's reputation. He's the guy with nine lives. He finds a way to pull it out. No, I didn't think it was it because Terry Eames was confident that he would be able to put a package together, and keep the track. He was so positive that whole season with me that he, he had things going on. 
he had options that he had three options that I, I, I have options at this point. You know, I'm not even, I'm not worried about it. I'm choosing which is the best option. That's how good we have it right now. And because he had always delivered before, a lot of people thought that he was going to deliver again. And then as the season wore on, you know, I would probably ask him every two weeks. So where are things at? Where are things at? Oh, don't worry about it. It's all good. We're going to save this thing. It's not, it's not going to go to auction. And as the season went on, you could tell that he probably wasn't being honest about everything that was going on, but he, he still didn't lose that optimism. The optimism never left. Because he's always kept that, you know, that optimism. I mean, he, he just, he never seems down. He always seems like he's going to, you know, turn one more corner, you know, and, and, and things are going to be good. And then in the weeks leading up to the auction, even then he was still totally positive that he was going to find a way out. I was confident that it was going to remain a racetrack, but I was, I was also confident that Terry was going to pull something out of the hat because he'd done it so many times. There was a showman quality about Terry from the first time I met him. I knew he knew how to put on a show and he knew how to add drama to things to bring attention to them and make them positives in his business. And I really believe this was part of the show, that he had the whole deal done. And just like he had done it the times before, the day before, he's going to come out and say, here it is. I have it done. The auction is scheduled for Saturday morning. And, and I remember calling him on Friday and saying, so what's going on? Because I'm sure he's, he's going to pull a card out of his sleeve, you know. He, and, and, and at that point, he, he just said, you know, I... I don't think I can pull it out. I don't think it's going to happen. I didn't even know how to react because I just, I didn't think that was ever going to happen. That week when he said, I don't have anything, like four days before, right. well, that kind of, I still thought he was going to do it. Yeah, when Terry said that it was going to foreclosure and there was nothing he could do, it's like he, the dude finally ran out of his nine lives. Did you think it was going to survive the auction? No. No. When I heard Terry couldn't pull it off and it was for real going to auction, I was about 99% sure it was over and not going to exist. I know in our camp, we're like, it's done, man. By that point in time, I, I had a real uh, relationship of trust between Sean Corshane and myself. So um, I didn't see a downside, I guess, at the time of just sharing it. Maybe I was, maybe I was saying this is one way to broadcast to people that might be out there who might ring the phone and say, hey, I'll, I'll, <laughs> you know, I'll come in with you, you know. You know, when we got down to where it was getting very close, I tried to sell it for commercial development, you know, and I called everybody and anybody that would be a possible player in that business. And there was no commercial property selling anywhere, you know, really in the state. So there just weren't any sales going to just sell that as developable industrial property because I would have bailed out that way, you know, had I been able to. I knew the Waterford Speedball and Terry Eames as long as I had been there. And suddenly, I, I was trying to grasp the fact that it wasn't going to be the Waterford Speed Bowl with Terry Eames anymore. There was definitely a threat there that this is, this is it, this may be the end of the Speed Bowl. That's your biggest fear as a race fan and, uh, you know, as someone that loves the Speed Bowl. So all I kept thinking was, please let somebody buy it that's, you know, into racing, wants to keep the place alive. It was definitely scary. I don't want to be that guy talking about the place I used to race and having it be gone, you know. So uh, there's just so much history there. and. I've been through so much there, it's just, uh, it really would have broke my heart to see it go away. We lose that. It'll never go back as a track again. It'll be gone forever, so we can't lose that. It's um, part of our history. A lot of people would miss it. I mean, I knew Terry was going to show up. He had told me he was going to be there. I went there to try to see... You know, after I paid off the, uh, you know, the dribs and drabs uh, above a, a million uh, eight, um, where I'd be, you know, and, um, and, you know, thinking I'd just go and buy a restaurant for me and, you know, cost it a run or something and, you know, live out my days. But, um, you know, obviously that didn't happen. You know, I just, I remember Terry walking up and saying hi, and I just said, hey, how, how's it going? And. I remember him just saying, yeah, I've had better days, you know, and, and then it, it took on this weird kind of festival atmosphere because suddenly like fans started showing up and track crew started showing up and, 
people were tailgating and making burgers and showing up with trays of coffee for other people and john comes over picks me up we take i call him up say you want to go over to this auction say sure i'll not do anything comes over picks me up we drive over there so i was just like playing it by ear about what's going to happen i remember asking terry do you have any feeling how this is going to go down and he told me he didn't you know there was a side of me that was again ever the optimist maybe i'd put a deal together you know to be part of a new partnership you know that day and 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 one, two, three, four, at least four people of the dozens that I had talked to during the year were there that morning. So there, there was a reasonable shot that maybe we, uh, you know, come up with a handshake deal, you know, a- at the auction. If you would have asked me one week before the auction, I would have told you that a group of lien holders collectively as a team or somewhat of a team were going to go in there and bid enough money to cover all of our debt, and if somebody wanted to outbid us, at least we'd all get paid and be happy. Two days before the auction, one person backed out of the deal, and I knew that we were out. There was no possible way that we were going to become owners of the track. The people are showing up, and you're trying to find out who's who, and who's doing what, and who's got these thoughts, and I'm talking to Terry, and I'm asking Terry, what do you know about these people, what do you think these guys are doing? I really thought somebody that wanted it as a racetrack would be would buy it. Yeah, either a you know a, a, a Rocky Arbitel involved group or Bruce Beamer uh, or a couple of other people you know might might have shown up to to buy the thing as a racetrack. We're standing there. I have no idea who the players are. I had no idea what was going to happen. Everything was such a mystery about who the bidders were. There were so many rumors floating around of who was going to bid on it. I had some ideas about the parties that were involved, but they were all playing their hands really close to their vests because everybody was trying to protect their strategy. So Rocky's over there and obviously Sean, they're standing across. Everybody is in a circle. Anyone else? And I just happened to be where I decided to stand. Just so happens that now I'm standing behind Beamer. I still don't know who he is. Current bid, $1,500,000. $1,550,000. All of a sudden, the auction starts. They start the auction. This guy starts bidding. This strange guy that I don't know who he is and the other guys that are there covering it with me don't know who he is and I'm asking people do you know who this guy is and nobody knows who he is. I'm looking at John I'm like who's this guy you know is he for real and as the bidding's going on I'm like all right I don't think this is going in a in the way that anyone here had thought that it was going to go this was this was we're going way off script here. Here comes Beamer that nobody heard about and all these guys that said they were going to bid on it never showed. The, the lack of number of players surprised me. Um, I didn't think Bruce had any interest at all. Uh, and then he shows up. You have that that group uh, with Arbitel and, and, and Dickie Saravolo. They kind of do a little conference and they talk and then they make a bid. Current bid $1,600,000. And when they make that bid, Bruce just comes back and overbids them. The other thing that struck me is how quickly the bids went up. And he's just going back and bidding every time Bruce just comes back and overbids them. And then those other guys group together and they all talk. And then Sean Monahan's in there. And What's going on here? Because the stranger's taking this over and he's clearly on a mission, you know? say we're done and it's like whoa the stranger got the place who is this guy congratulations mr beamer one million seven hundred fifty thousand 
Bruce makes that final bid and, and the the Arbitel Cerevolo group backs off. It's like Bruce Beamer bought it. Like, all right, cool. Like, doesn't matter who this guy is. Is it going to be a racetrack or is he going to turn it into a helipad? Jerry Collette, who I knew from the track but I didn't know well, stands up and says, that the Speed Bowl is going to stay a racetrack. That was the longest 15 seconds of the Waterford Speed Bowl's history. It was funny because as that announcement was made, we're going to keep it a racetrack. I think that every single person there was thinking the same exact thing. And that answered everyone at the same exact time. And it was like this sigh of relief. Like we don't know who this guy is and I don't really know who Jerry is, but obviously he's involved with Bruce. I was hopeful for an owner, an investor, somebody that could come in with the right funds to do what this track deserves. And by all the stories I was hearing, it sounded like like uh, that this Bruce guy was the guy that was gonna be able to do that. When you're upping the ante like that, effortlessly, putting $10,000 into new toilets is not going to be that big of an issue. He seemed like a pretty honest dude, you know? Um, and, he's, and he seemed legitimately happy about what had just gone down. We were at the World Series. We were, we were in a rain delay standing in my trailer. That was the Thompson we weekend, right? When yeah. I, yeah, because I remember talking with uh, Ricky Saravola. I kept asking him, what's going on down here? Have you talked to your father? What's going on? What's going on? I ain't hearing nothing yet. The day that the auction came up, we were racing at Thompson. You know, I was constantly checking your phone. You know, what would you hear? You talk to anybody? Any trying to find out anything or hear what's going on? Yeah, I was on the Facebook that day, live on the toolbox, just <laughs> waiting for news. At that auction, you're at Thompson, right? At Thompson, we were doing our radio show live from Thompson, like between one and three, and that's when Sean Corshane gave us a word that the track had been sold. Somebody had called me and said that, you know, the Speed Bowl is saved, you know, somebody somebody bought it and it's gonna keep it a racetrack. And that was my worst fear, is somebody just gonna buy it and, you know, mow the place down and put a Walmart or something, you know? Yeah, I was at that track and we finally heard and then I was like, who bought it? You know, we already knew, never knew who this guy was. I was surprised at who it was. I mean, I, I you gotta admit, you know, Mr. Beamer pretty much slid under the radar there. Nobody really knew who he was. I knew nothing about him. I didn't know what his business was about. He told me he was in the propane business. Had you ever heard of Bruce Beamer before? Never heard of him. And I'm in the heating business. Bruce Beamer, I even though he has a business in Glastonbury and I live in the next town over, Manchester, I had never heard of him or his business. I didn't know who Bruce, who a Bruce Beamer was. I didn't know what a Beamer propane was. I know nothing about the guy. Nobody really even knew who Bruce was or his history or anything. I really didn't know who he was. And had you ever heard of Bruce Beamer before? No, never. Never. I haven't. Nope. nope. I haven't even heard of Beamer's uh, petroleum. I had never heard of Bruce Beamer at the time. I had never heard of him. No. <laughs> Bruce who? They said somebody had a, that he owned a propane company, and so I looked up Beamer propane. Believe me, we did some Google searching the night of the auction. Have <laughs> <laughs> you ever heard of him before? Oh, yeah. We did, uh, he was a customer of Air Gases, so I knew yeah. about Bruce Beamer. <laughs> I have a, I think, convenient memory loss for some of it because it's just too painful to think about. But I, I spoke with dozens of people about partnering with me and, um, uh, you know, trying to make this work or, or buying me out or, or, or whatever. And my advisors had told me it would go for a lot more money. So I probably would have taken the fire sale. Um, had I known how how little it was gonna gonna bring on on uh, October eighteenth of, of twenty fourteen, I sure as heck wouldn't have spent the seventy thousand dollars on grandstand repairs alone uh, that we we did in that winter. We leased the parking lot to uh, Lawrence Memorial Hospital uh, for they had a, they had a big strike and they they needed to house employees in a satellite lot, and um, we had we got paid well for that. And uh, my my lead attorney, not my bankruptcy attorney, but uh, my local guy said, why don't you just take that money and run? Don't open up for, for 2014. I said, no, 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 I'm going to find somebody. I'm going to turn this around. And I, I used my own hands and, and $70,000 to do the extensive work on that grandstand 
only to end up losing it. Ever the optimist. I was, it was, I was going to get it this time. It was a sad day. I had built up a pretty good friendship with Terry Eames. And it was sad to see, to, to realize that day that, you know, this was probably it. You know, he wasn't, he's not going to be part of the Speed Bowl anymore. And then, then I ran a show that, yeah, we ran the show that night. What was the interaction with the people at that show that night? Uh, they obviously had known what was going on. Was it bittersweet? That, that must have been a hard show to get through. You know? Yeah, I think I hid. You yeah. know, I mean, I, I think I was there, but in the office trailer. I mean, a lot of 2014 I hid in the office trailer. I, I just, there were, there were just too many questions I couldn't answer. And, you know, I was always there to, to deal with emergencies, but between Yocasta and everybody else I had working for me, I could monitor the radio and, you know, text and everything and figure out what's going on. I thought that the track was uh, well run when he was there, especially uh, when he came back in 2009. From my point, I thought he was a good guy to work for, and he knew how to run the track. That was the only, I only knew the Speed Bowl with Terry Eames, so th there was a, a sadness that came with that. If you ever listen to Terry, and I, did, I used to talk to him a lot, he had plans of, of putting stands in the back and, and like pretty much changing the whole way that place was made and putting suites up on, the, on in turn one and all that and if any of his ideas could have been funded. I think wholeheartedly he really wanted that place to work. You know it just unfortunately the way things are and how much insurance is are for tracks and it's you're gonna start off you're not gonna make any money at it. Let's face it if he had the money he would have did it because he could have sold that place and see you later and been scot-free and he never did that so for that, I got a lot of respect for him. Do you regret buying the track? I don't. I don't regret buying it. And there's two types of regret. One is business regret. You know, if only I'd made a different business decision. And then on a personal basis, as far as personally, I don't regret any of it. From a business standpoint, I regret expanding it so much and trying so many different things and not being real about what could happen with the value. Because again, we always thought real estate values were gonna to continue to rise. When I got $200,000 an acre from Harvey Industries, I'm saying, wow, I got 31 acres left. You know, here's my retirement. You know, I regret not being more realistic about what that was. So I, from a business standpoint, I regret not taking the offer from Coca-Cola that was north of $3 million you know, in like 08, 09, in that, in that era. I regret, on a personal basis, losing my temper with some people. Oval track racers tend to take a view that the facility is some sort of publicly owned facility and the promoter is just some hired general manager who's, you know, like, it's, like it was a park owned by Waterford. And so he should be subject to any kind of criticism because it's all for them. No, it's private enterprise. It's a business, you know. Maybe a 10% of that clientele are just very insensitive, irrational, outspoken uh, people that, that, you know, some of them, if I saw them today, I'd get red-faced just from seeing them. <laughs> but from a personal standpoint, I had more uh, pleasure than sorrow for doing it. You know, I, I wouldn't have met <laughs> the, these characters, you know. The, you know, a, a John Brower Jr. always comes to when I think about this because he's kind of like, you know, the one I bonded with the most. He's, he's kept it there for us, and people can say bad things about him, oh, he owes this person money or didn't pay that people money, but the place is still there. You gotta give him some sort of credit for that. Terry's tenure at the racetrack was a lot of ups and downs. There was always rumors going around, it seemed almost every year that the place was gonna shut down. You know, every year opening up was always, it was tough. It seemed like that got tougher every year, but he always managed to pull it out. He was always there come April to open up the track for us. He was always unlocking the gates whether he thought he could or not and always find a way. Terry's full tenure there I thought was for the most part successful. I mean the car, the car count kind of stayed the same. There wasn't always great crowds but there was plenty of events in his time that put a lot of fans in the seats and I feel like any track in North America that's tough to do it you know during those times the economy fell out from underneath us and a lot of people just weren't going to racetracks anymore so I think he did the best he could and like I said it was a racetrack the entire time he was there and I had some some place to race. I think it's the best race in Vienna going. A great side-by-side -side facility that 
I mean, as long as the guy on the inside of you can give you, it doesn't put you up into the, into the fence, you can run side by side for 35 laps down there and run hard. There's not many tracks in the United States that you can do that. It's a two groove racetrack, so momentum is important and momentum isn't necessarily purchased at the engine shop. Thank God not every place that's left is a big fast half mile. Where the only way to run good is to have a lot of money. You know, racing's never been cheap. You know, even when people think it was cheap, it, it cost money for a working guy. But, you know, I think Waterford's always been and remains one of those places where a guy can get further on a little bit of money and a lot of knowledge than he can with just a lot of money and no knowledge. When I got there, it was single line racing. I watched just these freight trains in every division, week in and week out. And I said, we're going we're gonna to legislate it so that people want to go to the outside. And the only way you could make it happen is to, is to make sure people weren't getting sent to the boards when they went to the outside of somebody else. You know, if you intentionally put them up, you're going to the back. It, it, you know, and we did that throughout all the divisions. We took a lot of crap for it. Oh, you're trying to run them like slot cars, all, you know, all this stuff. But if there's a significant thing I did, that's, I got that outer groove to work. Casual. Okay. Straight, it's a Sid thing, it's so it's all thing. casual. Should I put my hat on backwards? It's not that casual. <laughs> <laughs> great people, great episodes, laughter, successes, being able to do stuff that nobody had ever done before. Nobody tried doing this, nobody tried doing that. We tried it. We made it work. It was a great ride. It seems like in today's day and age, I mean, you have to have money backing you because there's going to be days that you're going to be upside down after the feature because you didn't get a crowd or... You didn't get as many cars as you wanted, so you, you need to have the funds for that rainy day. It just seems like the track is, it does have nine lives. Every time you hear something, every year, it was right. going to close. And it would just somehow always come back for more. It was just uh, one of the places you can't kill, and I'm glad you can't kill it because I love racing there. We have three really good tracks in Connecticut. And I think it's the best racing anywhere in the country. Am I prejudiced to the bowl? Yes, I am because that's I, it's where I spent a lot of my life, twenty years. And um, but I think that the racing there is just far and above beyond anywhere else you can go in the country. As a pure racetrack, it's got all of the elements. It's got just enough banking, but not too much and not too little. Um, the shoots are just long enough. If they were shorter. No, nah, it wouldn't work. If they were longer, it would change the complexion of the track. At the speed bowl, the fans are right there on the track. You know what I mean? Like at Thompson, they're set back. It's just the atmosphere is totally different than any other track. The speed bowl vibe is like, it's more like a home, hometown feel. He's going to pull it off! Ah, that's good. Third generation. <laughs> Proud pop, look at you. You got tears in your eyes, brother. Hey, shit, there you go. <laughs> nice job, man. Nice job. For the first time ever in the SK Modified Division of the Speedball, we have a third generation driver to grab a victory, Joey Gata. Hey! <laughs> I like the idea that I can go there and see somebody named Gata racing. You know, I like the fact that you can go there and Jeff Pearl's racing because I saw Jerry Pearl race there. And, and I'm, there's a million more, but I mean, just where it's been passed along, that love of the place. You know, you want a place that's well run, you want a place where the bathrooms are clean, you want, you want, you want a certain amount of things done professionally, but you also want to keep, if you've got a community racetrack, you've got to keep it uh, community accessible. You, you, you got to make the people in the grandstands and the people in the pits both feel like they have something invested when they go there on a Saturday night. You know, they, they know they live down the street from the guy that won the, the late model main or something. You know, they know somebody who knows him or he works with so-and-so. You know, as, as long as they have that and as long as, you know, the other issues that are way beyond people like us, you know, taxes and land values and things like that, as long as they can keep it on that human race or Saturday night level, uh, I, I can see the place going forever. <laughs>